I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. The College of Complexes meets regularly on, at 2901 West Addison Street. We meet here once a week to present our speakers. The college has basically two rules. One, no personal attacks, and two, no one person, one, per, one fool at a time. And it I'm, I'm, looks like I'm having a little trouble remembering my verbiage, too. The format consists of the following. We have a brief announcements period. Then we have our speaker who speaks. Ted's presentation will probably be an hour to an hour and ten minutes. After that, we have our question and answers period. It is reminded that you ask a question and not give a speech at that point because at the end of our question period you'll all have a chance to get up here and uh, spot off for quite a while at the end of the hearings. Tonight our speaker is Ted Aranda. He's going to be talking about the uh, Empire of Deception. He'll be talking about false flag episodes in recent American history. Specific topics will include the so-called mass shooting in Orlando and the physics of 9-11. These matters are absolutely vital, of vital importance to all Americans. That a government can slaughter 3,000 random innocent people on its own soil for the purpose of advancing its hyper Muriel and pissed agenda with no consequences whatsoever and will and can and will perpetrate all manner of devious, further deviousness, diabolical attacks and hoaxes on the population. Ted, it looks like you're going to have a good Let's presentation. A warm round of applause for our speaker tonight, Ted Aranda. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out in the snow. I'll talk about two um, uh, topics today. Uh, one is 9-11, um, which was a false flag attack where um, quite a lot of people were killed. <clears throat> the second is the Orlando so-called mass shooting, uh, in which uh, nobody was killed, uh, certainly not a lot of people. Maybe they did away with uh, the so-called perpetrator, but there was no mass shooting. And together, false flag attacks and false flag hoaxes constitute uh, an ongoing large-scale, long-term program of psychological warfare being waged against the American people. <clears throat> So um, <clears throat> we can look at the attack on 9-11 as a problem uh, in terminal ballistics, okay, which is a scientific uh, field. It's the study of the behavior and effects of a projectile when it hits its target. Um, because this plane here is being used as a weapon, as a missile or a projectile hitting this target, the World Trade Center building there. <clears throat> and terminal ballistics is examined in, by engineers and physicists, uh, such as uh, these uh, authors here in books and, and learned articles. Um, and they often use very advanced mathematics and uh, technical terms, uh, but their conclusions are actually fairly commonsensical. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Is it's good. distorted or anything? Okay, okay. <clears throat> and now this is my conclusion even before I started studying this in, in detail, but it's corroborated by, the, by their research. Collisions are basically contests of strength. The relative damage sustained by two objects in a collision, whether A smashes uh, or penetrates B, or B smashes or penetrates A, is determined mainly by the relative physical strengths of the two objects. In other words, which object is made of stronger materials and has a stronger structure. And this is mainly because of Newton's third law of motion, which is an extremely fundamental um, law of physics. It doesn't change from day to day or year to year or century to century, right? Uh, this was an effect on 9-11 as in, on any other day. And this says that when one object exerts a force on the second object, the second object exerts an equal but opposite force on the first. <clears throat> so when two objects collide, uh, it doesn't matter which object is moving and which is stationary. Um, the force on each of them is the same. A, object A hits object B, and object B hits object A. And uh, this is the reason that even though cars are, you know, fancy things going real fast, machines, you know, when they hit a pole or a tree, uh, they're stopped cold because the pole and or the tree is hitting it just as hard as the car is hitting the, the pole, and the pole is much stronger. It's, it's a much denser, heavier uh, object. It's rooted in the ground. <clears throat> and the car is uh, not constructed that solidly. 
Uh, and especially, this is especially the case with trees. Uh, a car can occasionally knock down a pole when it, it is not solidly grounded, but never a, a heavy, a big tree. Just, they're just totally smashed. And the faster the car goes, the more it, it's smashed, the more it's damaged. Um, and the last thing you're ever going to see is a car slicing through a pole or a tree and coming out the other side intact and undamaged. If you ever saw something like that, you would be watching an animation. There's somebody stuck a screen in front of your face, and, and, you're, and you're not watching real life. <clears throat> now, people talk about, oh, the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of those planes, that is certainly that must have caused them to smash the, the buildings. When, uh, well, actually, the kinetic energy of a, of a moving object is lost as or utilized in deformation, or another term uh, sometimes uses deformation energy. And because uh, the, uh, the, the car, for instance, in, in this example, is so much weaker, it's the one that is deformed, because we're talking about a system. And, and the deformation it occurs in the system. And the object that is the weakest is the one that's most deformed. <clears throat> now, let's take a, a, a case of a bullet being shot at a steel plate, like here. What's going to happen in this instance? <clears throat> In this instance, this bullet is smashed by the plate. It's flattened and even liquefied, temporarily liquefied for a split second. Okay, <clears throat> now that, and, and this is what uh, bullets look like when they hit thick steel plates and are flattened. They turn into uh, thin lead chips. Um, but in that case, we didn't know exactly uh, what uh, that cartridge was, that round, or, or what that steel plate was. So let's look at a very specific example. Um, this bullet here on the left is a 5.56 millimeter um, cartridge. It's used in uh, the AR-15 rifle, which everybody's heard about, and also uh, a 223 rifle, 223, 5.56, basically the same thing. Pretty ordinary uh, uh, round, pretty ordinary weapon. <clears throat> this uh, one on the right is a monster. It's a 50 cal, 50 caliber uh, bullet. Uh, half inch in diameter and is shot with through uh, these fancy or you know monstrous uh, rifles. Uh, they are used in sniper uh, work in, in the military. And in this case, that round was shot at um, this three quarter inch steel target, three quarter inch steel plate. And here the and it was shot at, at this thing at uh, four times. And here are the rounds: one, two, three, four. These other pits are unrelated. Okay, but nothing gets through this three-quarter inch steel plate, including that monster round, as you can see there. It's stuck, they're, they're stopped cold. And the reason is that effective penetration of steel targets, and we're talking about you know, good thick steel targets, requires the densest, hardest, strongest, most massive projectiles possible. <clears throat> Take the case of um, World War II tanks, okay? You had entire tank battles. These were you know, formidable machines. Uh, what's going to stop those, uh, a machine like that, okay? Um, it takes a very serious uh, anti-tank round, a specialized, uh, formidable anti-tank round like that, like those. You can't shoot a tomato or a, a beer can at, at a tank and expect to knock it out, no matter how fast you shoot it, okay? So this notion of, of speed, 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 uh, nonsense, okay? Uh, <clears throat> this is a, um, a relic, uh, uh, maybe in an antique place or whatever. And so this is the round, uh, this is the casing, uh, this is the projectile, which would be solid lid on the outside, and it has a uh, hardened steel penetrator on the inside, this thing right here. Excuse me. As you can see, it's, it's really, um, you know, quite massive, this child is holding it. That's, you know, the bullet, quote unquote, that you have to shoot at a tank, at least in the World War II era, to knock it out. And it was found early on that you can use a, a, a material even denser and harder than, than uh, or I don't know about harder, but certainly denser than uh, steel, <clears throat> namely tungsten. Okay? Tungsten is more than twice as dense as steel, as you can see it in this table. And but for comparison, aluminum is a very lightweight metal, obviously. You know, everybody knows that, right? So with rounds like that, you could um, take out a tank. Not all the time. Some, you know, some rounds ne never don't penetrate but it's possible to knock out a tank with that kind of ammunition. <clears throat> but um, this is a, a yin and yang a sort of uh, uh, thing between ammunition and armor. Uh, like force, counterforce, one-upsmanship sort of uh, dynamic, right? So tanks were improved. 
Um, this is a more modern tank, and uh, the, the walls were made thicker, and there were techniques of construction that made them uh, harder to penetrate by those rounds that used to be used. Okay? So uh, we're jumping right into the modern era now. He has very specialized, very sophisticated anti-tank rounds like these. <clears throat> and here's another photo of this sort of thing. And uh, they use this, it's basically like a spear. Uh, this thing sticking out of, of, the, of, the, of the shell there. And this is another uh, um, illustration. They, so nowadays, they have this, like, like I said, kind of like a spear. And it's like uh, typically like two feet long. Oh, here, okay, I, I was afraid that I uh, lost my model. I was gonna freak out. <laughs> I'm particular about those kind of things. Okay, um, so uh, uh, they use a, a, um, a solid, not steel, but uh, tungsten or depleted uranium um, penetrator. And it's about two feet long and about an inch in diameter. And it's, it's, it's inside this, it's, called, it's this thing here, it's called a sabot, okay? And this is the entire shell. Uh, with the propellant there, that's the entire shell. <clears throat> and when it's shot out of a cannon, um, like so, the sabot falls off, it's ejected. And then you're left with um, this um, uh, <coughs> okay, like so. And this is a guy holding it. This is uh, actually, I think, an aluminum model. It's not an actual thing. That's why he's holding it so lightly, because that thing is heavy. It's like 10 pounds. Um, okay, so, but of course, tanks, uh, were improved because you know you have more sophisticated weapons. You need more sophisticated or more sophisticated ammunition. Tank rounds. You need more sophisticated tanks. So the the beat goes on. You know, um, force counter force. But again, the point is that effective penetration of steel targets requires the densest, hardest, strongest, most massive projectiles possible. And I brought um, uh, a a rod. It's not a solid rod because it, it's hard to find a solid one inch rod, but. I put it together, three rods that are equivalent to a solid steel rod. <coughs> now, this is the kind of thing that has to be shot at a tank to penetrate the thick steel walls of a tank. But remember, this is steel. Tungsten or depleted uranium is two and a half times heavier than this. That will give you an idea of the kind of ammunition you need to get through thick steel. So I'll pass it around. Let me start over here. Be careful with it because it's, it's fairly heavy. Not fairly, it's quite heavy. <coughs> To give you an idea of the kind of uh, physical material we're talking about. No, I don't want to take it. Okay, so um, now uh, the, the what you no, call it the um, planes. Okay, are nothing but aluminum shells. All right, and you can see that when they're demolished, as in this video by this uh, aircraft, aircraft demolition company. Uh, this is a Boeing uh, 767 which is the kind of plane that was allegedly used on 9-11, on, on the twin, twin Towers. And now to uh, uh, smash this thing to pieces, uh, all they needed to do was get an excavator uh, with a heavy steel claw, like so, okay? And they just went to town on this, on this uh, plane, uh, ripping it apart. This is the thin aluminum that this plane is made out of. And the, the claw just, uh, you know, eats it up no problem whatsoever, all right? Uh, and spits it out, like so. This is the, the thin uh, aluminum uh, shell, uh, skin of a, of, a, of a plane. And here the uh, machine is tearing up the uh, horizontal stabilize, stabilizer in the back, just rips it right off and throws it aside. Okay, uh, this airplane, as you can see, is, ho is literally hollow. The only very solid, uh, hard uh, steel and titanium objects on a plane are the engines and the, and the um, landing gear. Everything else is uh, air and, and thin aluminum skin. So this uh, claw obviously has no problem smashing this thing. Uh, and each of these uh, collision, each of these uh, impacts is a collision. Okay, thick steel versus thin aluminum, and it's no contest whatsoever, as you can see. <clears throat> Now, the uh, Twin Towers, as I've said and many other people have said, were mountains of steel, okay? No joke. Uh, the, on the outside, you had 60 uh, thick steel columns, uh, 14 inches on the side, 60 uh, on each side of the towers. Um, the in interior had these massive, I mean super massive, steel columns up to four and a half feet wide, okay? Um, now, the story is that the, the floors 
um, are between the outer columns and the inner um, and the inner core. Okay, that those were the weak point of the building, and that's what. And when um, they were damaged uh, in the impacts, and then the subsequent fire, that that was the uh, was, was what caused the building to collapse, which is utter nonsense on many levels. But I'll just discuss one of those uh, points of nonsense. Okay, uh, the floors were pretty, you know, good, s solid floors uh, made with a, st uh, a steel plate and four inches of concrete, and they had these trusses, and that's why they were called truss floors. So they were perfectly fine floors. The floors never failed before 9/11, right? Nobody ever heard of, of, you know, anybody falling through these floors, right? Um, but they, uh, it's claimed that that was the connecting structure between the, those massive outer columns and those even more massive inner, inner columns, and that's incorrect. That's false, and not only is it false, it's a lie, because uh, the government would know this and they would have engineers who know this. Uh, actually, there were uh, steel girders. These steel girders on both sides here, you can see, you can see the shadows that they cast. Um, I-beams uh, uh, connecting the inner core with the outer columns. And there are a number of these photographs. Um, I just brought a couple. Uh, this one here is a little bit fuzzy, but you can see the columns there and the white lines overlaid. And I brought this one because this shows you the pattern, like so. So you had all these uh, steel uh, I-beams between the inner core and the outer columns. So the building, and many actual engineers, not both BSers, right, have, have said that that building, those buildings were very solid, very well constructed, and they were, they were st uh, steel mesh, okay? And they were uh, designed, specifically designed to withstand several uh, uh, plane impacts. To give you a, an, uh, a more intimate idea of what these columns were like, these um, columns here that hold up the L tracks uh, around Chicago and have been doing so for 100 years, uh, it, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure it's about that, are, uh, are equivalent to the outer columns um, of the World Trade Center towers. Very strong columns, um, and if a car or a truck hit those, you know it wouldn't uh, do well. Um, the inner core columns are, the large ones are equivalent to these that hold up the expressways around Chicago. Okay, this is the Dan Ryan, nine, uh, eight lanes or more. And I, that's my bike there, I went up to one of these columns and looked at it closely. They are very formidable. When you get up close to them and, and you know, wrap your knuckles on them and, and, and get a good feel for them, uh, you know that uh, a plane wing is not going to go through these columns. It's laughable. I mean, it's actually stupid, okay? Uh, these plane wings that are so thin and it, you can literally, literally see them flap uh, uh, around when the planes move on the tarmac, okay? I, I, and I noticed that as well. They're not very formidable um, structures. These uh, I-beams here were outside of my apartment building in the street because they used these, these in, in, in road construction. And I went up to these two and um, tried to move them. Um, lift them, push them, or pull them. I couldn't move them one millimeter. This, when, you, when you get up close to these steel things, you, you can see that they are very, very massive, to say the least. Now this is a section of a plane, of that plane that uh, went down in the Indian Ocean. Um, um, it must have been maybe a year ago now, and everybody thought that it was lost. Uh, well, they act, also finally found pieces of it, and that's one piece, that's a piece of the wing there on some island, I think, or maybe Indonesia, whatever. And these guys are just hauling this thing around like it was nothing. You know, some of these guys are holding it with one hand, okay? This is not a very formidable structure. Look how easily they pick this thing up, okay? That's what's supposed to have gone through all of that steel, like so. <clears throat> so this is what's supposed to have happened. This is the official story. This plane uh, went through all these outer columns, um, the, uh, uh, those I-beams that they don't recognize, they, they don't acknowledge, but, and all that steel and concrete of the floors, and then knocked out several rows of four and a half feet by two foot uh, humongous steel columns, okay? <clears throat> this is another diagram. The plane would be coming in from the bottom here, and it says here, column damage severed, severed. Like, you know, cut in half. Uh, all these outer columns and then several rows of 
integral columns. The thing, the, the idea is absolutely asinine. Nothing short of, you know, you run out of adjectives to describe this idiocy. Um, so let's look at the video, uh, one video of, of this alleged incident. This is the Hezar Khani video, a very famous one, and one that shows uh, more clearly than others um, what ha what's supposed to have happened in detail. So watch this plane. In each of these frames, you go an equal amount of time and distance, okay? Or time, anyway. Um, watch how this plane goes. And, and when we get here, you see that little flash? Don't worry about that flash. I, I don't want to waste time explaining it. It doesn't mean anything. But um, watch the uh, way the plane moves through that building. It literally uh, moves through that building as if the building isn't there. 100%. Not 98%. Not 99%. 100% as if the building isn't there. There's no damage to the uh, plane. Nothing breaks off that plane. It doesn't slow down. It doesn't veer to one side or another. Uh, uh, and the building even isn't damaged. Because all you see is these shadows or these shadings. Watch that right wing go melt right into that steel, not even be damp knocked off. And then all you have is these fuzzy, fuzzy balls. You know, It's animation. Pure simple. It's animation that's just as much as any cartoon. <clears throat> and to top it all off, some of the videos, um, the ones in real time, okay, they, they, they were more difficult to do, to, uh, live. They show the plane, see the plane coming in there from the right? They show that plane going clean through the building. All that steel and concrete without being damaged. No damage whatsoever. There's the plane having gone through the building. It's proof. That's that's absolute proof that uh, the whole thing was uh, was fake, uh, a fraud, a lie. You had so here you have nose in, nose out. It's the same image. That's all it is. It's an, uh, a CGI, computer generated image. It's not a real plane at all. Here's a cartoon for reference sake. Uh, this is a steel plate that's going to pop out of the roadway. This is ro the Roadrunner, the Roadrunner cartoon. So here comes the Roadrunner. Of course, the coyote can never catch the Roadrunner, right? So the Roadrunner flies right by, and here comes the coyote, and you know what's going to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Okay, at least I laughed when I saw it for, uh, you know, the first time. So this coyote, uh, this, you know, a, a, an animal's body is supposed to have warped this steel plate down to his uh, ears and, and toes, right? It's a it's cartoon, right? cartoon physics and children laugh at it. Wow. Children know that this isn't real. Uh, this is not real. This is a cartoon. A plane wingtip to wingtip, not just the engines mm -hmm. or the, fu uh, the fuselage, um, but down to the wingtips cutting through all that steel and even the inner core columns. Okay? It's cartoon physics. The entire scenario of planes being used by Muslim terrorists on 9-11, and therefore the entire official story of 9-11, is sheer, unmitigated, 100% nonsense, the most stupendous lie ever told by a government to its citizens. So let me jump right into um, Orlando. <clears throat> You're getting a two for one today. The story is <clears throat> uh, this ISIS uh, maniac kills 50 in, in a gay club. That's uh, Omar Mateen. And uh, whoops! And um, the club was the Pulse nightclub, right? And it's supposed to be <clears throat> the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history. Now that would obviously be a very, very big deal if it were true. But it's an utter lie. I mean, just an absolute uh, ridiculous lie. In fact, it's pure bullcrap. And I'm not joking. I am not joking. Uh, as one uh, commentator said. Many are calling it the, US, the worst U.S. terror attack since 9-11. I, however, prefer to call it the most blatant example of government-coordinated false flag horseshit since the beginning of time. And that's very well said. So here's the uh, sign of the Pulse Night Club. Here's the club. People were supposed to have been running out of here after being shot, being dragged out, crawling out. Okay, 50 people killed, 53 people injured, uh, severely injured. There would have been blood everywhere. There would have been rivers of blood, oceans of blood. Okay, there would have been tracks, or, you know, footprints of, uh, of blood. Let's look at this thing close, more closely. There is no blood anywhere, and I mean not a drop of blood anywhere. 
not here where people would have been coming out that ex ex exit, uh, not here where people would have been coming out there in the parking lot, uh, uh, nowhere is there any blood. Okay, whoops, this thing caught up there, whoops. Okay, so uh, here is um, a closer uh, view. The computer's a little slow, sorry about that. Okay, so here's a closer view, and this inside here, this patio area, that was supposed to be a scene of bloodshed, right? Um, that's inside the premises of the club. And look at the white paper, okay? Look at these people walking around, supposedly in a, the scene of a mass murder, and there's no blood on their shoes, there's no blood on their clothes. There is literally no blood anywhere, okay? Uh, this is the side of the club. There was supposed to be uh, supposed to be 50 people killed. Where are the bodies? There was not a single body shown. How do, how do you have a mass murder and they, there are no bodies? Okay, no bodies and no blood. Um, there, people were supposed to have run out and been and, and uh, been dragged out of these holes here in the in the bathroom area in the back. This is the back wall, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, what happened there? But uh, the point here is that, there's, and there was a shootout right here, allegedly, right? Where's the blood? Uh, this, this guy was supposed to be splattered. I mean, he was supposed to be shot multiple times. His blood would have been splattered all over the place. People were, were running out of here. There's, not, there's no blood. Uh, people were supposed to have been cowering in the bathrooms on top of toilets, <coughs> bleeding, with, blood, with dead people all around. Okay, uh, they described, you know, all, all the, the, the people that uh, told the story, oh, there was blood everywhere. Here are the toilets from the bathroom. That's one. There's no blood anywhere on those toilets that you know bleeding people were supposed to have been uh, standing on. And as the guy's pants, as you can see, is spotless. There's another toilet over there um, to the upper left. No blood. And of course, uh, nobody would have cleaned the toilets. <laughs> That's you know forensics 101, uh, destruction of evidence. So if there was blood, it would have been s s still there. So here's the uh, uh, timeline. At 2.02 a.m., this guy, Omar Mateen, in the red here, is supposed to have come into the club and start, immediately started shooting up, killing dozens of people right away. And then uh, he engaged uh, with an off-duty police officer, and they had a gunfire, uh, gun uh, shootout. And then uh, more officers came, more uh, gunfire. Okay, this is the alleged story. This is what is supposed to have happened. And then uh, Omar Mateen ends up uh, uh, with a whole bunch of people in the bathrooms holed up in a hostage situation. And then um, uh, a SWAT team comes, comes in. And then the SWAT team tries to uh, blow through these walls with explosives, and that doesn't work. So then they bring in this uh, bear cat. Um, hold on, the, the, the computer's a wee bit slow. Okay. Okay, so they bring in this bear cat, this machine, this truck with a, with a battering ram, and they, they knock in those holes, the holes that I, that I showed you earlier, okay? At this point, people are supposed to have been running out of this hole, as I described, and being dragged out and all that. And then, as if this guy, you know, would do something as stupid as to try to have a gunfight with this whole squad team, on the, you know, gathered out here, okay? The guy had, anybody would have had more brain cells than to do that, but anyway, that's the story. So then they shot him. Now another stupid uh, uh, aspect to the story is that uh, because he's supposed to have strapped um, uh, an explosive to his body, I'm waiting for the computer again, sorry. Okay, because he was supposed to have strapped uh, an, uh, a bomb to his body, uh, they had to uh, knock more holes into this uh, wall here to get people out of this uh, bathroom, okay? As if they couldn't go in, uh, in uh, the other entrances. There were six entrances to this building. But anyway, that's the official story. All right? Um, and we're going to be waiting here because the computer's not uh, up to speed. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so that's the story told by this guy, John Nina, uh, the police chief, that uh, this guy, Mateen, was killed outside of the, um, outside of the building. And then Tim, Tim, what? Uh, is there any way to speed this up? No, just um, I I don't know. It's just you're just gonna have to wait because it's it it should it should be okay.
You're, okay. Okay. We're just going to have to be patient with it. Now, that story is contradicted by this um, guy, Mark Canty, the Orlando SWAT commander, okay, who said, Tim, it's slow. Is there any way you can put on your hard drive? Yeah. It, uh, Ted, it, it's actually accessing your drive faster than this one. You know, look, my hard drive. We, we were having the same trouble when it was on my hard drive. Um, I would just keep advancing it. It should, it should work, and if not, we'll try, try again. Charlie, Charlie, you didn't bring your computer. No, no, let's... <clears throat> I tell you what, I tell you what, um, maybe if I get rid of, yeah, if I get rid of the previous um, files, no, no, just, 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 just what you need to do is just be patient. Let's try, let's try to go. Exactly. Let me get rid of my cameras. No, no, we're gonna, we're gonna shut this up. This is Windows 10. This is what happens with Windows 10. Yeah. Well, and it'll take about a minute or two to, to, to go. Um, there is. It's just what it's trying to do right now is there's a TV. American people were shown cartoons. They should just do advances quickly. They should advance quickly. Hey, Charlie, I'm going to answer questions on the first part because that first part is done. Yeah, go ahead and answer questions real quick. <clears throat> if anybody has questions on that first part because it's, that's complete, uh, I can start okay, to hang on. What were those white pieces of paper supposed to be? What were those white papers? Uh, okay, inside the club, uh, you know, there were pieces of paper, napkins and stuff, yeah, white. Uh, there was no blood on them. Okay, why wouldn't there be blood anywhere? There was no blood anywhere in that club. Uh, and people are supposed to have been uh, shot up. You know, uh, 50, uh, 50 people killed, 53 injured. Uh, where's the blood? You can't, you can't have a mass shooting without blood. Yeah, uh, yeah, damn. Uh, what about the people who were, the relatives who were crying and said they had to bury their relatives? Were they all lying? Yeah. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, um, there uh, were uh, videos of people laughing at the funerals. I mean, I mean, I don't, I'm not talking about, you know, 
a little giggle. No, I'm talking about rip roaring laugh, laughing. All kinds of uh, uh, a lot of the people um, involved had uh, like uh, improper funerals. Like they, 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 there was no actual uh, uh, location or you know cemetery location or whatever. All kinds of irregularities. There, there's no evidence that anybody was killed. Or uh, yeah. Any other questions? All right, Ted. Which one were you on? I was on. Um, um, 9 11, when the airplane went through the World Trade Center, so they showed the front end of the plane yeah. coming through. <coughs> Did they ever so called find any parts of the plane? Uh, well, they claim to. They claim to have uh, uh, found a few parts in weird places. They didn't find any parts. Uh, Below the, the 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 impact site where they no, should have been. Like how it, it came through as a whole airplane. Yeah, they that's didn't what the video find shows. Any big no. Pieces. Well, again, they showed uh, a couple pieces, like a piece of the fuselage. Okay, okay. Ted, we but it was it was like in a weird place, and it, there were no um, uh, identify uh, identifying codes because all, all plane parts have identifying codes. Uh, they, that was not shown. Everything was irregular, but uh, the video. Clearly shows something impossible, right? And then didn't they also so-called find the passports or the yeah yeah intact the passport. identifications yeah. of the the hijackers? Yeah, after um, mysteriously after, on the streets, yeah. still right, right, not right. burnt, not right after everything else was was purchased. Not torn, not burnt. Where are you at? I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. Thanks, Tim. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Okay. Okay, now it seems to be going just fine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I was saying, the story of Mateen being killed outside the club is what uh, John Nina said, this police chief. Then the SWAT commander says something completely different. And the interviewer asks him, where is he exactly? Where is Mateen? He comes out into the hallway between the two bathrooms. They engage, he fires, they fire. That's where he was taken down? Right. In the hallway? Yep. Okay. One guy says, outside the building. The other person says, in the hallway. A big contradiction, and that's not the end of it. Um, this woman, uh, Patience Carter, claims that um, he was in the bathroom with uh, her and others when uh, he was killed. She, uh, she says, he actually started backing into the bathroom stall itself that we were inside of, and I could see his feet. Then the police bust through the wall and shot him dead. Okay, so And that's corroborated by uh, this woman, Tierra Parker, her friend. So you have three distinct versions of where the... Uh, killing of Mateen occurred. Uh, one outside here, in, as, as in this uh, image, another inside in the hallway there, and then a third inside the bathroom. How can you have three completely contradictory uh, stories of, of reality? <clears throat> and so which one is the truth? Actually, none of the above. The entire event was an unreal fabrication, and everyone involved is lying. And this is a pattern. This isn't, I could, show you, I could tell you more examples of this kind of utter contradictions. Impossible contradictions. Okay, that is that's uh, uh, proof pretty much. That's in a court of law. You know that'd be the that'd be it. The, the law, everybody would walk out and, and the jury would be asked, okay, guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Uh, guilty of fraud. That is. Okay. So now look at the here's the time again. Two or two a.m. That's when uh, the shooting was supposed to start, right? So how is it that you can have posts on the internet of this event on June 11th? The incident happened on June 12th. Early morning, June 12th, um, Sunday. These are posts from June 11th, Saturday. How do you have posts of an, of, of an event that's going to happen in the future? And not just any old posts, not just something happened. No, exactly as described uh, later, as described later. 50 people killed, 53 injured. Not 49 people killed, not 54 people injured, but exactly the, uh, the number that came out in the end. Uh, here's a tweet by this guy, Stuart Moore, a reporter, by the way, and, and reporters are often in, in on the game, <clears throat> um, the, the whole, the whole uh, you know, charade. He's tweeting at 12.05, two, two hours before the shooting starts, about uh, the shooting, suspect wearing a bomb. Okay. Here's, here he's tweeting uh, 13 minutes before the shooting even starts, uh, uh, somebody locked in the bathroom. Here's another reporter talking about deputies have Orange Avenue blocked off near Michigan Avenue, near Michigan Street. That's what's going to happen in the future. 
because she's to, uh, uh, reporting this at 12.21 a.m., an hour and a half before the incident even starts. What does this mean? This is foreknowledge. Huh. Okay. And <clears throat> exact detailed foreknowledge of a spontaneous random event is a logical impossibility. <laughs> okay, thanks for fixing this. It's working fine right now. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> let me give you an example of, of what we're talking about. Let's say somebody says uh, today, there is an earthquake or there was an earthquake in Chile in this particular town, not that town or that other town, but this town. And 573 people were killed. Not 572, not 574, uh, not 573. Okay, and then uh, somebody says that today. And, and you go to the internet or you check the news. There's no, bomb, there's no earthquake in Chile. Uh, so, uh, but tomorrow, it ends up that there is an earthquake. And exactly as described. Okay, that scenario cannot happen. Because you can't, nobody could say right now, I, I got it. Uh, nobody can say right now that uh, there's going to be an earthquake in any particular place and there's going to be exact, and some exact number of people killed. That's impossible. But now let's say somebody said that there was going to be, um, uh, somebody said there's a bombing in this town in Chile and that many number of people were killed. Okay, uh, that's possible. How is that possible? The person could be, uh, know about the plan. There's a plan to bomb some, uh, you know, some town in Chile tomorrow and this person knows about it. But could they say that there were going to be 573 uh, three people killed? Exactly. A bombing is, uh, uh, to a certain degree, a random event. So even that couldn't be predicted because uh, you couldn't know exactly how many people are going to be killed in an actual, ordinary, random bombing, right? Um, so what would have happened, had to happen is that somebody would have had to go there and make sure that number of people were killed by shooting them or whatever. There could have been some kind of bombing, but you would have to make sure that it was that number. Or more than likely, much more likely, the whole thing was a hoax. Somebody just made up this new story, okay, and, and the press passed it on. That's what that's what foreknowledge means. It's proof of a plot, a plan, a conspiracy. Okay, so here uh, is another. Uh, here's more evidence of of the uh, uh, hoax of, of this incident. Here you have um, the Orlando Regional Medical Center, which is just a half mile um, from the Pulse nightclub. Okay. Um, it's a short ride. It would have been seconds, a uh, couple minutes at most, to get to the uh, Pulse nightclub from there. And of course, with such a huge mass shooting, there would have been ambulance co coming from many other hospitals in the area, right? There was not an ambulance to be seen, except for one or two incidents, okay, where this ambulance was just sitting there doing nothing. But generally speaking, there were no ambulances. There was not a flood of ambulances, which is what you would have had in real life. Here's the Pulse nightclub. Over here, where are the ambulances? There were no, for all practical purposes, no ambulances. The, so the reporters um, camped out at the um, at the hospital <clears throat> to uh, breathlessly report on the injured people coming in. Right? No activity at the hospital. There's the entrance to the hospital. Where are the bodies coming in? Where are the injured people coming in? There was uh, no, no activity at all at the hospital. Okay, another aspect to this uh, hoax. What's, uh, how, you know, the, the weapon used and how it was supposed to have been used. <clears throat> Nicholas Dane, uh, an experienced <coughs> uh, says that killing 50 and wounding 53 running people would require some pretty amazing coordination and marksmanship skills. This feat would be incredibly hard for me, he's you know, highly trained, and impossible for an untrained asshole like the team. Another Army veteran says, to be able to hit 100 moving targets in less than seven minutes, that is an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable feat, even with a fully automatic machine gun. And Mateen only had a semi-automatic, which means he had to pull the trigger for each bullet. He could just hold the trigger and you have to you know, spray, spray uh, bullets. How can Mateen carry that much ammunition? He would have to have a backpack carrying all of the clips inside, and it would be hard for him to reach for more, or have an ammo can, open fire, drop the can, then reload again. Now you may think, well, these are just technicalities. You know, anybody can figure that out. No, these are serious logistical problems. These are the kind of problems that you, that military men or people, women or whatever, have to figure out. Okay, and it's not that simple. This is an AR-15. <clears throat> That's the weapon supposedly used. He would have had to have a can uh, weighing some 40 or 50 pounds, like this. A lot of people ca can't even lift that, much less handle it. Uh, so he has to be reaching into this thing, pulling out cartridges, uh, excuse me, um, clips, not just loose ones like this, but clips, and loading his gun repeatedly, repeatedly, okay? 
This guy here in an experiment, and this had nothing to do with Orlando. He, there are a lot of um, uh, videos that show guys, you know, playing with their guns, basically. He uh, took this AR-15, he modified it into an automatic, so it, it shoots uh, bullets continuously, and he wanted to see how uh, much shooting uh, you could do with an AR-15 before the gun failed, okay, you know, burnt up or whatever. Uh, and so here he has all the clips he's going to use. Notice that he has them on a nice and nice and neat on a table. Okay, that's how you can handle that kind of uh, uh, number of, 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 of rounds. So here he goes, loading up the gun and shooting out, shooting it away, shooting away with it. After a couple minutes, it's red hot. The barrel is red hot, cherry red, as you can see there. But it keeps on shooting. Finally, it blows. Okay, this uh, an AR-15 is not meant to be shot you know, hundreds of times, uh, hundreds of rounds per, uh, in, in just a matter of minutes. The barrel blew up, okay? And this is the count of all the reloads, all the clips they used, and he had two malfunctions, where he had to stop and examine the weapon. This is reality, okay? That, gave, that would have given people 24 chances to do something, anything. There were hundreds of people in the club. It's totally unreal. Okay, um, he, uh, this guy in this video shot uh, eight, about 830, not about, he shot 830 rounds. That is the, about roughly the number of t uh, rounds that Mateen would have had to use because he had to shoot 100 people. Many of them were shot multiple times, reportedly. He had three separate uh, uh, shootouts with police. We're talking easily 1,000 rounds. Okay, so it's pretty much, and with an automatic, excuse me, with a semi-automatic, not an automatic like that guy in the video. So the, the whole thing is pretty much laughable. An AR-15 is not actually a very formidable uh, weapon. It's a military, excuse me, it's a civilian version of the military M16, which is, is just standard service rifle. It's just uh, an infantry rifle. <clears throat> it is not a machine gun. This is a machine gun, okay, an M240. <coughs> this is a standard uh, US military machine gun. <clears throat> that is a beast, and you have to have it mounted, or you have to have uh, shoot it prone like that, and then you can swap out barrels when they start to get hot. And they're also specially ventilated. And they have um, these ammo um, uh, belts, okay, that feed the, the uh, cartridges. And then you even have uh, ammo cans next to them. This is specialized equipment. This is the kind of equipment that you have to use to shoot off thousands of, you know, many hundreds of rounds. Uh, or have a, a specialized ammo backpack feeding um, the cartridges into the gun. An AR-15 is not going to cut it. Uh, to think that this guy, Omar Mateen, who wasn't trained to shoot anything but a regular gun, he, he was a, just a security guard. To think that he could do this Rambo type of thing is just a lot of the Okay, so let's look at um, <clears throat> the damage that was supposed to have been done by Mateen and his gun. Okay, we're talking about gunshot wounds. <clears throat> These are medical emergencies, okay? You have immediate effects of severe bleeding and hypovolemic shock, which means inadequate delivery of oxygen to vital organs. Uh, those are the immediate effects, and then you have long-lasting effects of major disfigurement, permanent disability. Uh, people take months to years to recover when they're even just grazed, okay? Um, and then you often have several surgeries. You have psychological trauma, <clears throat> PTSD, nightmares, depression, okay, your mind is messed up. Here's a real story uh, told by this Army Green Beret. <clears throat> the femoral artery runs down the thigh. It supplies oxygenated blood to the leg. The relatively small but powerful projectile that hit Staff Sergeant Nick Lavery's massive leg struck and shattered his, uh, his femur, severing his femoral artery in the process. Without immediate medical intervention, the wound would have killed him from loss of blood. He survived, but lost his leg above the knee. That is a serious leg injury. That is a serious leg injury, or I should say, real leg injury, because most leg, you know, gunshot wounds are going to be, uh, I, I should have been saying gunshot wounds, not just an injury. But that's entrance wound, exit wound, okay? This is generally what happens when you get shot, um, when you get shot. Here's uh, in the entrance wound to this guy, uh, this guy's wound, that's the exit wound. Okay, his leg was just, you know, just turned to whatever, okay? And his femur was shattered. 
And then uh, here he is recovering, or rather wrapped up. This guy is not going to give an interview anytime soon, right? And certainly he's not going to do so glibly. He's on life support. Yeah, he's really. Bad. This woman was shot two days ago. She, her femur, supposedly, was shattered. And here she is, just la la la, you know, giving an interview about the story. It's pure bullshit, okay? Just sheer nonsense. She even had time in those two days when she's supposed to have been, she would have got, been in surgery, she would have been on drugs, okay? Uh, she composed a long poem. She had time to compose a poem. She was feeling so good. This uh, uh, guy here, this person in real life, uh, pretty much had his uh, uh, foot destroyed by a bullet. This man here in Orlando, okay, he had uh, two wounds, one to his foot and one to his uh, leg. That's supposed to be a bullet wound to the leg. That's supposed to be a gunshot wound. That is supposed to be a gunshot wound. Somebody took a bat and smacked this guy in the shin. Okay, I've had injuries to my shin like that, literally. Now, now before uh, you start laughing at this, I got something for you to really laugh at. This down here is the same guy's bullet wound to his uh, foot. That's his uh, gunshot wound to his foot. Okay. Now you can you can hardly even imagine how how that would happen. I mean, the bullet would have been going horizontal, and it would have just nicked him, right? Now it's possible for people to be you know have minor injuries when they're shot, right? But that that's the exception. It's a pressure ulcer. His big toe isn't correct either, so he they were tied. It was tied off. So uh, the, the norm, the norm is for people to ha have severe uh, injuries when they get when they get shot. Here's a, a person that got shot in the in the abdomen and had colon injury, had uh, colon damage. This person got uh, shot and had uh, a uh, kidney damage. Okay, and um, so they have to, you have to rip these people's bodies open, abdomen, and then sew them back up. That's called uh, a la laparotomy. Okay, the, the surgery itself is very serious, even if nothing happened to you, much less the damage done by the bullet. This uh, young man, he had, uh, he was shot in the stomach, and he had a laparotomy. Here's his story. Seven days in the ICU, intensive care. Eight in primary care. Okay, talked two weeks in, in the hospital, um, in, in severe shape. Healthcare workers worked endlessly day and night to make sure I stayed breathing. I was in a coma for some of it. He was not uh, writing poetry. Okay. The next few months of recovery will be difficult for me. I am still in pain. I walk with a cane, and I'm generally slow and get fatigued very easily. This woman, Tierra Parker, who I, I showed you earlier, she was shot two days ago. And she's giving an interview like nothing happened. Okay? No sign of pain. Just like Tierra and all the others, I'm going to show you a couple more. No sign of pain, no trauma, uh, no, no sign of being drugged. That's supposed to be the entrance wound to her uh, gunshot. She's supposed to have been shot clean through the abdomen. And she shows how it came out the other side, on her, her, through her backside. Two days ago, okay, that's, she has Band-Aid. Band-Aid. Right. It, it, you don't even know what's under the Band-Aid. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. The, the woman was not shot. And here she is giving interviews, okay, constantly. And then here she is, two days, two days after being shot, she's bending over. Or uh, you know, doing chores or whatever. She just, she's actually showing uh, the, supposedly the clothes that she was shot in. This woman was not shot. Here is a um, person who was actually shot <coughs> in the upper body. That's the entrance wound. This person was, was died. Okay, this gunshot killed this person. They cut him open and sewed him back up because you know he had to be presentable in, in, the, in, the, in the casket. And so here's the path of the bullet, and it severed his liver, okay? That guy was killed. This guy was shot, <clears throat> shot yesterday, the day before, this video. This guy was shot four times in the back, hmm. quote unquote, okay? He's giving the thumbs up, making a Facebook video, he says, and think what he says, I'm fine. <laughs> I was shot four times in my back. Thankfully, they just went straight through. No major organs were hurt. How the fuck? You get shot four times through your back, and, and, and as if your body was made of air, as if there was just air inside. Okay, it's 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 movie movie crap. Okay. Yeah, actors. Exactly. Um, here's uh, so here's the guy giving an interview. You know, so pleasant. That's his 
supposed uh, uh, gunshot wound, nothing but a bandage. Okay, that's one of four, by the way. And here he shows it again. Not here, he doesn't show anything at all. It, it, you, clearly, there's nothing there except that little bandage. There's no wound there. He's fine. Everything's fine. He's being paid, very well paid. Here's um, a, a real life situation of a guy who, whose elbow was shattered. He was shot in the arm. Okay. His elbow was blown off, literally, bone and all. He had to have a um, abdominal flap put on there to replace that flesh that was blown off. Here's another grizzly arm wound. Okay. Sorry to gross you all out, but this is reality. Um, and he had to have an abdominal flap. Okay. Here's Rodney Sumter from Orlando, who was shot in both arms. Okay. And not only that, he was shot through the middle of his back. And he's standing, sitting on a stool, sitting upright on a stool, not laying down, not on a you know chair with a back, giving a nice you know happy interview to this guy. Okay. Calm as can be. All these people, perfectly calm, no problemo. That's supposed to be his gunshot wound. Okay, pure fake. Okay, and this this uh, this is one reason, one way that you know that it was fake. There's no exit wound. This guy Rodney Sumter, one of the supposed um, um, Orlando victims. Okay, there's no exit wound. Um, that is a, actually a fake. Uh, this is how easy it is to fake. Okay, you can. Uh, this is makeup. Special effects, and you can see this on the internet all day long if you wanted to look at all, look at it all. Okay, it's very easy to fake these things. That's actual. That's an actual fake. Okay. <clears throat> and here's uh, this guy, Ronnie Scepter again. This is the location of the gunshot wound. He would have been shot through the spine, and if right. so, if somehow or other he missed his spine, it would have gone through his lung, and possibly his heart. This guy would have been very, very lucky to be alive. He's not. He's not going to be running around, right? This is this guy's uh, arm uh, gunshot wound. Where's the where's the where's the hole? It's just a uh, uh, skin, and it's probably not. They probably didn't even bother to peel the skin. They probably just painted it red. This is not a gunshot wound. Okay, he says my elbow was blown off and reconstructed. That arm right there. Okay, and uh, that's an elbow that was blown off and reconstructed. And this is his other uh, arm. Okay, more makeup. Yeah, because he's got keloids. That takes a while to get keloids. It's just so fake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, here he is, one month later, dancing. Dancing. He okay. got paid a lot of money. And, he, and when you watch this video, he's dancing just as well as these guys up there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another month later, just, you know, a couple months, okay, after he got shot in the back and arms and all that, mm -hmm. he's, he's doing another dance. And this one is really vigorous because the guy's a good dancer. The guy was not shot. Okay. Here's a, a gunshot wound to the uh, uh, hand. Okay, this guy lost his thumb. Uh, this uh, person uh, was shot, entrance wound, exit wound. His hand was completely messed up. Now, I'm going on at length uh, about this because there were numerous uh, people who were shot in various places, right? And you can easily take the real, the real case and, and, and compare it to the, to, to the example or to the Orlando case, right? So this, guy, uh, this guy's uh, hand uh, was that bone there was completely blown, you know, knocked out, and he had to have an, a muscle flap put on there. He had to have a uh, rod, a pin, just, uh, put in his hand, okay, and uh, also a tendon graft, okay, and here's, here's his hand, um, a year later, it's, it's messed up. Here's the man who was shot in the hand, he, he, he shot himself in the hand, actually, this guy. Here's the story. I have really bad nerve damage in my hand now. I'm 26 years old, and my doctor tells me I'll never be able to use my hand the same again. The muzzle blast ripped up most of my hand. My pinky, I can't feel at all. My ring finger and middle finger are about 50%. I still can't make much of a fist. This was two weeks ago, right? Here we go back to Orlando. Happy Orlando. Angel Colon. Two days ago, this guy was shot five times. Okay? Including in that hand right there that he waved. A miracle. Just miraculous, right? <laughs> and look at this nice little smile. Um, he was shot three times in the leg. I shattered and broke my bones in my le left leg. Plus, the, his hand and his hip, five times. This guy is doing an interview two days later. 
And watch his right hand where he was shot, that right hand right there. At the beginning of this in, uh, press conference, they couldn't decide which microphone to use. So watch, watch how he moves his hand to pick up microphone after microphone. That's the right hand there. He wasn't shot in the hand. He's not in the hospital either. He's, this is in the side of the hospital, but it's a press conference. Uh -uh. Okay, he, his business, if he was shot five times, is being on the hospital bed doing nothing but trying to recover. That's his right hand that was supposedly shot, right? Where was he supposedly shot? In that right hand. Let, hold on now, hold on. Okay, and then he's shaking uh, hands with other people with that right hand. So when I smile, right? <laughs> this guy was shot five times two days ago. That was the official story that this he was shot in the right hand? Yes, plus four other times. And he didn't know that the film would show this? <laughs> Andrew, you're asking very difficult questions. <laughs> Sorry, I'm no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so anything. this is the injury. Right. This this here is the gunshot wound to his hand. Okay, mm. what they did was they nicked him. They took yeah. a scalpel and nicked his hand and put on put in a few stitches. And they're, they're trying to pass that off as a gunshot wound. They're two separate wounds. First of all, how does one bullet do this? I mean, it's totally idiot, it's totally idiotic. So what we have is, on the one hand, uh, movies and fiction, and on the other hand, reality. Contrary to what Hollywood teaches us, many gunshot injuries are not simple and clean. Bullets can inflict horrible wounds that damage vital organs and blood vessels and require radical, debilitating, and expensive surgical procedures in order to prevent death. In many cases, life after being shot is never the same. These events take place in less than a tenth of a second, followed by a lifetime of trying to get patched up and rehabilitated, says this doctor, a firearm injury expert. In real life, Getting shot is ugly business, as if we didn't know that. Okay, let's look at the response of these people, okay, to their friends being killed. Friends and family. This is reality. This is um, a person grieving. Some of these people that I'm going to show you are from a 9-11 uh, commemoration. Okay, does anybody doubt that these people are crying and grieving? No, this is reality. These are people crying. When you look at these people from Orlando, like this woman here who supposedly lost her son, she can't cry. She literally doesn't, does not cry and cannot cry. Okay? She can, however, read cue cards. When you watch her, her eyes, she's reading cue cards. She's giving this little speech. That was uh, a, the day, day after. This is three days later. She's happy. Her son is dead. And she is just... Uh, you know, happy as can be, saying stupid things like, the love is going to usurp the hate. Christopher was Orlando's child. Even though I gave birth to him, Orlando is now the adopted mother. Isn't that sweet? Sounds like Sandy Hook. Exactly. Just like Sandy Hook, pure bullshit. Now, this guy is called by people who look at this, this incident, the worst actor in the history of the universe. <laughs> this guy, when you look at this video, he's crying right now. Believe it or not, this guy's supposed to be crying. He's speaking in a voice just like this, but I, it sounds so stupid, I'm not going to carry on. Okay, throughout this whole interview, and he's wiping away non-existent non tears, okay, he can't, he can't cry, because number one, he has nothing to cry about, number two, he's a terrible actor. Here's another guy who's supposed to have witnessed, uh, now that guy we just saw, he's supposed to have lost a friend. This guy's supposed to have witnessed shooting, okay, and he's trying to cry, but he can't cry because there's nothing to cry about, he didn't see any shooting, and he's a bad actor. So what motivates these people, okay? We, you know, motivation is always uh, a big part of these things, uh, crimes. Here's Patience Carter, who we saw earlier. What she was actually, or uh, I guess at that time, probably maybe still, she was a, a Fox uh, intern, an intern reporter, okay? And which is already halfway to celebrity, right? Because these reporters are pretty much nothing with celebrities. She also started her own network, the Gen Next TV. She's a wannabe. She's a wannabe celebrity. And we don't have to conjecture about this because she made a video about it. This is from a video she made. And she's singing. And this is her song. This is, these are words from her song. I'm just trying to make a dollar, to make money, trying to get rich, to make a million. That's the video that she made. Okay? This guy here, Christopher Hansen, he was all over the place. They interviewed him uh, you know, many times. He said, this is, these, are, these are his words, blood everywhere. There's blood everywhere. My hands were just covered with blood. His blood was all over me. He's supposed to have picked up a guy and put him on his shoulder, and a guy with a back wound bleeding all over him, right? Where is the blood on this guy's shirt? This is what he was wearing on that night. 
Where's the, where's, the, where's the blood anywhere? I'm telling you, when I say that there was no blood except for, I'll show you in a, in a second, but generally speaking, there was no blood anywhere in this incident. This, this guy's blood, uh, uh, clothes, has no blood. He's supposed to have crawled through blood. Okay, there's no blood. But here he is uh, making a video for Dance Your Ass Off, this program, because he's a little overweight and he's gonna dance his weight off. And he made this little dance video, and here's the first thing he said in, in this video. He says, I'm ambitious, and he repeated this, okay? So this guy is a wannabe actor. He's also shown in other videos, um, you know, in acting scenes, or, or in front of a acting uh, places. So anyway, here's, here's another video he made, introducing Christopher Wal uh, Hansen. And look at what he says on his t-shirt. Remember my name, you'll be screaming it later. These people are wannabes, they're ambitious, and the government is only too happy to pay them. Heaven only knows how much the government paid these people in Orlando. This guy here, he gave this long interview, and believe me, he, 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 he's, he was as stupid as he looks, okay? This guy is just a clown, literally a freaking clown. And at the end of this long interview, this is what he says. Why I'm here talking to you, my whole reason behind this message is I want to be famous. He's supposed to be talking about a mass murder, okay? Okay, so um, here's this one video. Now, yeah, be, it's not too much longer, too. Okay. And here's this one video um, that is supposed to have showed what happened uh, on that night. Now, in, rea in, rea in reality, you would have a lot of videos from a lot of news sources, you know, TV stations, radio stations, whatever, and you'd also have the people involved who all have cell phones, that you'd have all kinds of, no. In this controlled uh, c uh, scenario, you had essentially this one video of p people being paraded after being injured and being carried, carried around. I'm only going to show you one, one of these uh, pieces of this parade, this one guy, okay? So here they come, okay, walking in front of this camera. They were set up very nice and uh, conveniently. Okay, oops. Hold on. Okay, good. Uh, so um, let me show you, let me point out to you a couple things about this video, or a few things. First of all, notice this building here, okay, with the, with the uh, cream and, and, and pink uh, columns there, okay? Just remember that, keep that in mind, I'm gonna get back to that. Also notice the cop cars in the back there. Okay, those are all cop cars. Why are these people carrying? Carrying him away from the... Why, why are they carrying him at all? When if <coughs> you, you would think they're, they're carrying him to the hospital, ambulance. right? Um, when you could have, there are no ambulances, I showed you that, there are no ambulances, and then um, even the cop cars don't seem to be unable to carry injured people, right? And secondly, you don't carry injured people. Everybody knows you don't carry injured right. people. Seriously injured people, you could hurt them worse. Another thing to notice about this video is that these people are all perfectly calm. There's no sense of panic, or pain. The, the, these people are, this guy was shot in the leg, and he's calm as can be, okay? And this is how all of them are. I'm only showing you one piece of this parade. And then notice also that they're walking toward the nightclub. There's the nightclub there, okay? That's the nightclub. Where did they come from? They're supposed to be being carried away from the nightclub to safety to, to the hospital, right? Also notice at the other end of this a couple blocks are more cop cars. What are these cop cars doing parked over there, a whole bunch of them, and a whole bunch parked over there? What's going on here? And these people are being carried toward the nightclub, okay? Um, there are, so, there are those cop cars just sitting there. Now, I threw this in because this is a real life, okay? This was at Oklahoma City in, in that bombing. Here you have EMTs. There, was no, there were no EMTs doing anything at, at Orlando, and they were, there was nobody in panic. These people are, you know, have a sense of urgency, right? Because this is reality. Um, another thing I want to show you is, another thing I want to show you is, um, this, this guy is supposed to have been shot, right? Where's the, all the blood that you would expect? This young man was shot by these paramilitaries. This is a real life video. He was shot in the left leg right there. Now watch this. Oh, this, this gray thing is gonna hide it a little bit, but still. Watch this blood pour out of that guy's leg like a fountain. Okay, there's the blood that uh, pours out of his leg, literally like a fountain, okay? And then he's uh, rolling around, that's his leg that was shot there. He's just covered in blood, rolling around in blood, right? There's blood everywhere. That's what happens, generally speaking, when you get shot. There's a whole lot, bunch of blood, right? Where's the blood on this guy? Just this billy to bitty it's, it's unrealistic. Ketchup. Yeah, exactly. Probably ketchup. Um, so here's this, in this RT video, they carry him, and that's where the video stops of, of this particular uh, guy, right? In other video, they drop the guy. 
They put him down. This guy that was shot in the leg. That's him right there. And here, here, here are his carriers, one there and one there. And they even are clowning around. When you see the video, they're literally clowning around. This guy does a little bunny hop, and they're, they're literally clowning around. Here's the guy standing on his two feet. This guy that's the guy that got shot yeah, in the middle? that's the guy that they just carried away. Okay? And people uh, who watch this say, well, this is obviously say, uh, proof of, of a stage scene, which it is. Now, another thing, uh, remember that building that I showed you, right? Uh, um, this is the building uh, that I showed you earlier, that I pointed out to you earlier. This is um, allegedly, after this parade of people, they were supposed to have been carried to a place, okay? This is the place. This is at the end of this RT video. But he was going the other way. You would, you would think, yeah, you would think that they were, uh, were you know, deposited here, right? That's actually where they started out. There's the red shoe guy, okay, the guy that we just saw. That's actually where they started out. This is the building right here, where they started out from. This is Sandy Hook, uh, excuse me, um, the Orlando Pulse Nightclub, okay? They were carried from this building in this direction toward the club. This is where they started out. Okay, and that's easily proven because there's the building, and there's the building, had very distinctive uh, architecture and coloring and these shrubs very distinctive unmistakable that's where they were at the beginning before they were carried so they were they were taken now how, why were they uh, gathered here to begin with there's the club they were gathered over here and then they were carried in front of this camera and this camera was about right here uh, as you and watch that Dunkin Donuts there okay there's a Dunkin Donuts there right across from the camera and nothing to notice is okay no how, no ambulances right the cop cars weren't carrying anybody anywhere, not even private cars. But this one uh, four by four is carrying people. It shows number, numerous people being carried by this, uh, uh, this this car. This car is one of the stars of the show, just like the actors. This car uh, vehicle was one of the was one of the um, uh, props. Because okay? they wouldn't let anybody through if they had it all blacked off like that. <laughs> so so you had you had here you have uh, the cars these uh, cop cars parked over here a whole bunch of them dozens of them dozens parked over here and then uh, people being carried uh, in front of this camera which is over here there's the Dunkin' Donuts there's the Pulse nightclub what you have here is a frigging stage scene okay a, a, a setup stage set like in movies this was a movie production okay and extras. Uh, yeah, um, so that's what happened in, in, uh, in Orlando. This is a duck, I'm, I'm concluding now. Yes. That is a duck, right? Yeah. And that is not a duck, right? Yes. It's a toy, it's a fake duck. We have reality, real mass shootings, and then you have Orlando, which was unreal. There were no dead bodies, there was no blood, there were no believable injuries, no tears, no substant, uh, substantive videos. There were three very short videos, a few seconds each. They didn't show crap. There were fatal contradictions of all kinds, bald-faced lies, obvious, terrible acting. It, it, there was no mass shooting. It was a false flag operation. In a famous scene in The Matrix, um, Neo is brought into a computer program. Okay? And Morpheus explains to him, you've been living in <coughs> a dream world. Now. What is The Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control. And that's to some degree, in some way, what we're living in today. A dream world uh, designed by our rulers through the government. The US government is a criminal regime grounded in massive, pervasive deception. It is a matrix for our enslavement, a gargantuan organized crime syndicate that makes the mafia look like a Boy Scout troop. In fact, it is the ultimate enemy of the people and must therefore be eliminated. That's it. Thanks. Wow. That's my um, website. Our website is a group now, actually. And you all are invited to visit raftd.org. So, uh, where's the moderator? Andy, are you the moderator? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm not going to call on people. You call on people. All right. I'll, oh, I'll just call a couple. I'm going to okay. give me two minutes. Okay. I'll go first. Okay. Go ahead. What is the motive behind? the so-called government's falsification of 9-11 and the Pulse nightclub shootings, and what possible PR could they gain by staging these two operations? Okay, these false flag operations have um, several, uh, there are several motives behind them. One of them is to inculcate fear in the populace. Okay, you have these horrendous incidents 
People get scared, and then they say, okay, well, we have a law. Uh, after 9-11, they had, they had a law already drawn up, the, the Patriot Act, right? That's going to take away, that literally takes away our civil liberties. This is a, a method of uh, gradual, or sometimes not even so gradual, enslavement, okay? They are uh, draconian measures. Ultimately, uh, there's probably going to be uh, some even more massive incident, and they're going to declare nationwide martial law, okay? Uh, another reason to uh, stage these things is to get ready to uh, uh, prohibit guns, people from having guns. Now, I'm not, yeah. I said it before, I'm not a gun nut, and, and in some ways that might be good, but that's not their point. That, they're, they're not here to protect us from guns. They're here to uh, instill in us uh, fear and also uh, take away the means by which people can uh, uh, defend themselves against tyranny, more or less. Okay? Uh, there are other reasons. Um, you have to demonize uh, sectors of the, uh, of the population, like Muslims, uh, and also countries, so that you can invade them. All right, um, and that's what happened after 9/11, for, for instance. Uh, after 9/11, the U.S. went on this crazy imperial, uh, uh, you know, uh, invasion streak. Uh, they had uh, countries lined up, ready to be invaded, and that's what they did. You can't be uh, invading other countries and killing literally millions of people without some uh, good excuse. So 9/11 was the good excuse, and they they've created it. And they said before they did it, that they were going to do something like that. They said they needed a new Pearl Harbor, um, and they explained that it was in order to be able to uh, go around conquering the world. And you're co quoting now from Project for the New American Century, yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. So uh, well, I, I didn't have time. I, I, in the original set of, uh, I had a whole section on motivations, but uh, okay. it would take too much time. There, okay. there are a number of reasons that they do these things. Okay. They, they're, they're well motivated to do these things. Okay. Then. Yes. What's your background? In what, okay, in what way? In my education? Yeah. Uh, I have a PhD in history uh, from the University of Illinois. Um, I was uh, an organizer for a long time. I've been an activist with numerous organizations, including Greenpeace, for many years. Um, I uh, was involved, very heavily involved in Occupy, Occupy Chicago. And um, I, I do a lot of research. I, I wrote a book on, on democracy. Um, you can see a lot of my work at, uh, at this website. Why don't you go ahead and log into it, Ted? Do you you can hang on. Let me. Huh? Do you have a military background? No, 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 no. Okay, this is. Um, the, I have a question. Then, why they re, why, are they crazy? Why they report them if it's not true? They want to create panic mm. around. Yeah, yeah. Among yes. The people. yes, exactly. They, they're sick. Then they criminal and they. Of course, they're criminal. That is that is out not uh, criminality. But I'm not. When I say that the United States government is a criminal enterprise. I'm not joking. I'm not exaggerating. I'm. This isn't, you know. They just want to create panic, right? Mm -hmm. They want to create panic. Uh, one, that's one of their motives. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are they mental? So, or something? so they. Uh, Those no, no. They, they're not stupid. They're criminal. They're not stupid. They, ha they have methods. Uh, in, in, in 19, I think 33, the Nazi regime, uh, when it was coming to power, state or actually after they've gotten in power, they uh, burnt down their uh, um, the Reichstag, which was their. Um, like uh, our, our Congress building, what is it? The Capitol building, right? Um, they burned it to the ground and blamed this, uh, this, other, this guy. It was a false flag operation, and that enabled them to consolidate their power. Then you cannot believe them, the reporters. No, the, the media isn't on the game. Right. Completely. But you know, sometimes, the mass, the corporate media. Like actually, my favorite station sometimes is Channel Seven, like ABC and Fox sometimes. And right now, I'm pretty skeptical. You know? Yeah, you should be. Very, yeah, skeptical. Should be. Very skeptical. Good. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so why do you think it is that it's so difficult to have discussions on these issues? Uh, in all sorts of forums, for example, you take uh, an intellectual community <clears throat> like a university. Uh, back in the day when I went to school, you actually could have discussions about this. Of course, this is back in the 60s and 70s, early 70s. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have a situation where these things, you know, whether you believe this or not, uh, whatever authority figures you may bow down to, you, you would think that there would be some discussion and that people would want to have discussions. Why do you think that's not the case? You know, I haven't been in, in, in a university setting for quite a number of years, so 
Uh, I'm sure uh, that they might have discussions. They, there might be discussions in uh, classrooms about 9-11 and false flag operations. Now, assuming, assuming for the sake of argument that those kinds of discussions don't uh, occur, um, the universities are um, part of are, are part of mainstream institutions, and there are a lot of taboo subjects. Uh, right now, there, there's a list being drawn up by this this organization. I forget what, what the name of uh, of, of, of professors, kind of like suspect professors. It's like it's like the list uh, in the uh, by the Un-American Activities Committee in the 1950 uh, or 50s. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there, and then people are being have been fired. People have been fired for expressing "quote unquote" controversial views against, go, you know, government. In, in fact, um, uh, uh, Stephen Jones, I think, one of the 9/11 investigators, uh, he was like an engineer. He, I think, he was fired. And Judy Wood, I think, uh, I think she was fired. So, uh, really? yeah, there's the, the universities uh, as a whole are pretty much mainstream institutions. And that, to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons that I didn't want to be a professor because I didn't want to have any constraints, constraints on me. I didn't want to be told what to read, write, think, or, or research. So, so does that boil down in your mind to just simply fear of uh, losing jobs, intimidation, threats, and, that, and that's what the motivation is? The motivation for not speaking? Well, I, I mean, again, you know, if you're somebody who, let's say, is a professor, mm -hmm. you've got tenure. Yeah. Theoretically, that gives you academic freedom. You could talk about things not only within the classroom, but out in the uh, very, very, world. very theoretical. Yeah, that's theoretical. There, uh, Finkel, uh, this guy named Finkelstein. Okay, he is a critic of, of uh, the Palace, uh, the Jewish lines. There are uh, in, invisible lines um, that you can't cross. Um, there, as I said, there, there. Areas of study and, and discussion that are kind of taboo in this country and in, in, in universities. Yeah, and so again, you're saying fear and intimidation. For yeah, and, and another thing you have to consider is that um, we are taught as, you know, as, as, as students and then graduate students and then being professors in these institutions, you are constantly being pressured and taught to go with the flow. Uh, that's again. That's dummy one reason that down. I never wanted to even be dummy in that down. environment. Dummy it down. We've been dummy down. Generation. We were in a courtroom, and it was cross examination time. You have absolutely no one you could call to testify. You have no one that wrote a tell-all book. For Fifteen years. Wait, what were you Out of all about? these people. There's no one? Charlie, be specific. I don't know what you exactly Do you have anyone who participated and is in a tell-all capacity? I participated yes. in this shooting. Well, actually, um, there were people, uh, people who have been killed. 9-11. Uh, so you have no one? I'm not a, a Do lawyer. Do you have anyone? I'm not a lawyer, Charlie. You don't have one person. I just told you I'm not a lawyer who's going out looking for witnesses. I am a, an investigator, a researcher who examines a uh, phenomenon. You have no one who can collaborate anything you present. Not one person. Uh, didn't I just tell you, Charlie? I am not uh, somebody who corrals people to come investigate and sit in a courtroom. I am a researcher. No one to verify your can I answer that for you? Yeah, Go ahead. What Charlie is asking is uh, we should uh, use the justice system. If you bring a dead body full of bullets into a sheriff, the sheriff will say, put the body on ice, uh, put the eyewitnesses on ice, and wait until the killer comes in here and says, I did it. Until the killer comes in here and says, I shot that guy, we're not going to have any kind of evidence. That's, that's the point that Charlie's trying to make, and we don't no. run the justice system Very that simple. way. simple. You bring somebody in and testify and you What Ted, Charlie, what Ted point. is saying is yeah, the yes. evidence of the crime is overwhelming. And then you want to know if there's people that have been selected that are being investigated. There's a book called Another 19 that lists 19 of the people that helped orchestrate the events of 9-11 that that's, day, 19 uh, top people theory. in the Bush administration. That's not a theory. These people right. were in the cover-up.
Yeah, so don't, don't, we're going to try to keep the heckling down to a minimum okay. tonight, please. The heckling, you can't give me one name All right. of a question. person from that uh, shoe Dad, the hen has a question. He said, Another I know 19. it was Logan. Yeah, Dan. Okay, Dan. Yeah, okay. All right, Dan. Um, what, do you have a PhD now? Yeah. What was your thesis about? Um, it was, generally speaking, uh, democracy. Um, it was uh, about democracy versus uh, the representative system. Did you, did you anything about 9-11 in it? No. In no, 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 that was years ago that I, uh, I mean, that was before 9-11 that I got my oh. PhD. Okay, another question. Um, did you, where did you do your research? On the internet or did you go to Miami? Did you go to New York? Did you go anywhere for, to interview no. people? No. Okay. So it was all sitting at your computer? Yeah, just, just sitting on, on my computer, you know, pushing, yeah. Okay. okay. I got a somewhat more technical question because I know that you were talking about times and foreknowledge and everything else. Are you familiar with the internet protocol times and how they work? Because I can definitely see how there could be a five hour gap of foreknowledge when something happens because London, England is five hours ahead of us and that they use something called coordinated universal time which is what they use a lot of times for, you know, postings and Twitter. And depending on the type of computer you have, it may synchronize itself for certain things. I'm just wondering if you had taken anything like that into consideration or taken the time of the posting in Google at face value and didn't dig to look at the actual UCT of when it was posted. No, I'm not a computer expert, but there are computer experts, including this one, um, that mm -hmm. I um, cited um, in my presentation on right, Sandy right. Hook. This guy went through the, the technicalities, the detail. Okay. He was a computer expert, and he said specifically, uh, this here is 100% uh, proof. There is no uh, question of any of, of those uh, you know, issues that you're talking about. This guy was an expert who knew about that. And there are other people who uh, would know about that kind of thing, and uh, I, I Kind of take no, no, nothing is you know you, you have patterns right okay? right it would be um, if this kind of thing this foreknowledge happened you know once in a rare blue moon okay you would think well okay that that could have been some kind of glitch some kind of time problem no these things th these are patterns that are, are recurring and that adds to the level of, of certainty uh, that there is fakery going on just like in a courtroom uh, going to Charlie's courtroom okay uh, when you show uh, uh, patterns it adds to the overall evidence. So, body of evidence. Just, just to clear, you're saying that there was conspiracy with the Kennedy assassination, with 9-11, with Sandy Hook, and now you're talking about the Pulse nightclub shooting, yeah. correct? Yeah. And also that there's a lot more that we don't know about it, right? More that we don't know about. No, there, there's, there's other conspiracies. Other, yeah, other cases, yeah. I could have, uh, I haven't studied uh, that many of them uh, in, in that much detail, <clears throat> but offhand, there's evidence of, uh, that there was uh, that uh, um, San, San Bernardino uh, was uh, a false flag. Um, also, <clears throat> uh, Paris and, and um, the Paris business, okay, uh, the, the Nice business, where some okay. guys supposed to have driven a truck through 180 people, or some crazy things like it. They don't even show any blood on the truck. Uh, I haven't studied all of them in that much detail um, because probably, first of all, I don't have infinite amount of time. Right, right, right. And secondly, not all the cases lend themselves as well as the ones that I have studied to overwhelming uh, proof. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah. Are there any uh, public or elected officials who said they share your perspective or interpretation of the events? Public officials? Yeah. I'm pretty sure not. Uh, Politicians for 9-11 Truth. There's a website. Politicians? Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't know about that. There's politicians for 9-11 Truth. There's patriots. Uh, university professors, medical professionals for 9/11 Truth. There's all kind. Well, there's retired military intelligence professionals, about 150 of them in one group for 9/11 Truth. So yes, 
there are quick questions. But, but you're asking about specifically uh, uh, elected like, official uh, people uh, in office? Person yeah. to, uh, say they support your people in yeah. office. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, not not so many in office right yeah. now because you get fired or terminated right, right. if you're in yeah, office. If right. when you get out of office, yeah, yeah right. there's retired politicians that are talking with supporting. Uh, tips, tips. General, 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 they general, can't give me one. General, generally speaking, um, this uh, uh, subject of false flags is absolute no-go, toxic uh, uh, stuff um, for uh, actual uh, elected officials in office. That's why you don't hear about it. You don't. You don't hear Obama or or um, Holder. Or in fact, they're they're perpetrators of, of, of some of this stuff. Uh, no, you don't hear about that coming from from that. <coughs> uh, Charlie, uh, former Senator Max Cleland is one name you can look up. A senator that does uh, talking about the 9/11 false flag. What's your question, Charlie? Where's he from? He's a senator from Alabama. Oh. Okay. He was on the 9/11 commission. Uh, you said that 9/11 was done. Uh, they could pass the Patriot Act. How many people were arrested or prosecuted under the Patriot Act for all this they did? There have been people. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't know the names. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure there have been people taken taken away. Uh, so jail. you can't give me the name of even one person no. who was apprehended no. or arrested no. or prosecuted. No, but uh, Charlie. So they did all Charlie, 9 Charlie, 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 what's your point? Didn't, Charlie, Charlie, what, what is your point? You I, said they did this whole yeah. thing so they could pass the Patriot Act. I, no, I didn't say they did that whole thing to pass the Patriot Act. That would be one of the motivations. Another big motivation, uh, in fact, the bigger overall motivation would be to go invade uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and take over the Middle East. Now, tell me they haven't done that, Charlie. Well, they, they Charlie, tell me they haven't done that. Anybody. To the Patriot Act. If you have a question asking, uh, you know. All right, how many people were prosecuted no, I don't under know. the Patriot Act? Uh, whistleblowers. It's not it's not really happened. It's uh, a lot of whistleblowers in Obama's administration were prosecuted. Right. Uh, okay. Following up on bushes. You know, I, I got a question. I can look at some of the same ballistic evidence mm -hmm. at 9 11, mm -hmm. okay? And I can come up with a totally different conclusion because I'm familiar with, with what you're saying and I've been digging more into it myself and I'm beginning to believe the government account more than the conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. do you think I might have some bias or yeah. do you think it might be you're overlooking something I I, I want to know because well, you know I, I want to know because you know I'm looking at things like uh, you know what what certain people forgot like the the smelting temperature of aluminum and how it can blow up when it's and other factors involved with it well, uh, I, I still think it's a lot. I, st I personally still think it was eight people, and, and eight, I, I eight people? Or, or, or you know the 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 oh, the, 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 hij the nineteen hijackers who pulled off a very well orchestrated attack. Maybe you're going to sleep again. <laughs> but you, uh, no. Tim, you you'd have to present your your case and evidence, uh, and then uh, we would have to examine. It. I, Maybe I should. Yeah, you, that would be a good idea. But anyway, I, I, who has any question over here? Have you, yeah. Tried, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Have you uh, contacted the architects that are talking about 9/11 and? Uh, no, I haven't contacted them personally. <laughs> I've, I've looked at a number of their videos. Um, I forget this. This one guy made this really good video. Again, you know, I have to. I, ha I have to limit this for right, right, the, right. The time that I can uh, right. use in a presentation. Yes. I, ha I actually had a video by right. this guy, I forget his name, who explained very clearly, I didn't even get into the, the, the quote-unquote collapse of the building. Right. Okay, I, well, I limited this particular presentation right. to the, pl the planes yeah. into the towers. Yeah. But there's all kinds of evidence uh, presented by uh, uh, physicists um, that explains how the, the notion that uh, this collapse happened because of some uh, fire and some damage away at the top and then smashing down the rest of the building is, is idiocy, is, not, is, is incorrect nonsense for a number of reasons. Well, uh, because what they're saying is, if you have new stuff, and I think uh, they would be interested in knowing what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, no, I don't have any new stuff. No, I, yeah. I rely on the experts. They don't rely on me. I don't. Okay. It's not the other Thank way. Thank you. Question. Them. Right here. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if you know of any people like Mr. Trump. Does he believe in your theory? Donald Trump. How he, he don't know. We don't Has know. he said anything? 
<laughs> you know, keep it in. Sometimes keep yeah. funny, you know, funny. Uh, Very then, funny. Uh, then, first of all, um, let me uh, answer your question. Uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I, I, don't know, I don't know exactly. Okay. okay, go ahead. I don't know exactly what Trump feels about or says about 9 11 right now. But I did run into a, a, a short video where he, uh, at the t right after 9 11, he, ex he said, he explained that those, the towers uh, were very well built and that uh, the story doesn't add up. That's what Trump said. Do you, do you believe that uh, Obama was born in Kenya? Uh, no, I believe he was born on Jupiter or was it Saturn? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the rings of Saturn. On one of the little uh, satellites, you know, about 10 feet to wide. No, all right, was he born in Hawaii? Uh, no, I think uh, maybe Pluto. You know, the, 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 the New Horizon satellite had this powerful camera, and they found they saw Obama's birth certificate um, in the in the little uh, valleys of Pluto. That's not part of his presentation you know. back there. What do you got a question? Yes. Uh, so there's been all sorts of information put out concerning 9/11, like books, all these different groups of people that Andy is mentioning. Uh, and so, and, and a lot of the people have credibility by their profession or their history. So when you have this mass of people uh, who have some credibility making certain claims, mm -hmm. which uh, if it was proven to be true, would, you know, to say the least, shake things up like they haven't been uh, for a long, long time. So again, you know, why isn't there, uh, uh, you know, why isn't it raised that this should be discussed publicly, debated, so that the population could actually access two sides of the argument, uh, you know, which are there? What makes you think it is? Okay, um, I, it doesn't seem to me to be at all. Okay. Why not? They've been yelling uh, for 15 years. But they don't. It, it, Nobody knows what, what, you. Know, nobody, he's made five what, what, presentations what, what, to you. That this uh, presentation was our speaker here last week. isn't oh, going to yeah. get out to the population. We have the scholars for the economic. Okay, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me answer your question. Yeah. Um, the, or try to answer your question. Um, there are um, two uh, parallel uh, information universes and news universes in this, in this country, and probably in the world. Okay? One is uh, the official uh, side. Uh, with the, the corporate media, the New York Times, uh, CBS, NBC, etc. Okay, those people, all you hear from them is the terrorist attack on 9/11, the hijackers threw these planes into. Okay, they, they parrot the official story. They, there's not um, practically not going to be a word about uh, any alternative. At best, they're going to refer to it as a quote-unquote conspiracy theory. Um, on the internet, however, um, there are a whole bunch of people, um, and, and also books in the library. Okay. Um, they, they discuss every a aspect you can think of of 9/11. There, there, are, there's a, like Andy keeps on saying, there are a mountains of literally. If you took all the books and videos uh, uh, presenting the the story, the alternative story that basically I gave, there would literally be a hill, a large hill, if not a friggin' mountain of of, of that material. Um, so you just have to understand that um, the made corporate media uh, is called corporate media for a reason. Uh, they are not uh, interested in, in the truth, and they're part of the machine. And so you're not going to hear, you're not going to see that discussion, an honest discussion about reality uh, 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 in the corporate media. You have to go to alternative sources. And there you will find a lot of good discussion and a lot of evidence, proof, uh, videos, uh, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the, the thing is, just as you, you know, you're talking here and you're kind of getting two different reactions. Uh, to the situation. And all of that stuff is out there. Libraries are full of yeah. thousands of books. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some people pay attention to the corporate media. Mm -hmm. These days, a lot of people look at the alternative media. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but, again, you know, there just doesn't seem to be uh, very many people who are in a position of saying something or demanding something. For again. When I, you know, uh, back in the very late 60s when I was an undergraduate, uh, there were a lot of professors who stepped up in opposition to the Vietnam War and many other things that were going on at that time. You know, they actually stepped out, you know, regardless of their, you know, position. Today, you don't seem to have anything 
like that happening. And again, I go back, I'm just, it's kind yeah, of rhetorical. The, the, it the, seems to be the fear intellectual, and intellectual, Yeah, the intellectual environment is, 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 is more um, censored, uh, and also a lot of self-censorship. Um, but does that answer your question, or do you have a more specific question? Let's, uh, no, 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 okay. Okay. All right, let's get the rebuttals. Let's, uh, let's go to rebuttals. Uh, oh, oh, wait, wait. He, he, had, he had a you question. Had, you had a question real quick? Yeah. I, uh, okay, Ted, you, you researched 9 11 and you researched oh, no, no, Orlando no. and you said some other places. So obviously, you totally believe those things. But you also mentioned the incident in France where a, a truck. Uh, supposedly mowed down quite a few people. Now, would you say you are absolutely true that that was a false flag, or are you surmising, no, guessing? No, I, as I said, I'm not certain about that because I haven't studied it in detail. So, so that's off. That's not on my in my um, purview. Uh, so Thank speak. you. Uh, Thank but, you. Yeah, but just uh, just one further thing. Um, the offhand. Uh, 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 reports that I've seen fit into the same uh, pattern. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Let's go to rebuttal. Let's go to rebuttal. Now, now, same for rebuttal, Charlie. What, no, same. there's a question. What's a Panzerfeist? What? Panzerfeist. A, is that, is that, a, is that a, a tank? I don't know. Panzerfeist, weapon used against tanks, World War II. Okay. Well, we're not Only talking about, about that, Charlie. We're talking about 9-11. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll go to rebuttals. One, one, one final observation here. The media, the central media's job, is explained in this book, Censored News, the media's job, these people are paid to produce, to promote down. certain stories. It's a two-pronged process. Yeah, you know, like on all channels 24-7, they say, the earth is flat, the earth is flat, trust us. And on the same time, they're running a coordinated blackout on what I call Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends from the physics department. So when you have a group like Albert and his friends, that's not an opinion like Rush Limbaugh. Albert and his friends could send a letter to the president saying, Mr. President, we'd appreciate it if you stop saying the Earth is flat at your press conferences. We got some good pictures from the space shuttle. There's no way to combat the body of evidence, so the media runs coordinated blackouts. They black out the reality, the facts that are proven beyond any doubt or debate. There's no debate about the facts about what happened in New York. Seven buildings were demolished by some demolition crew. All seven were demolished that day. They set up cameras to film the first two, and they sold it as a terrorist attack. It was the greatest incidence of real estate fraud in modern history. Not only did the developer not have to pay for the demolition of those obsolete asbestos-filled buildings, but they got three and four, something like four and a half billion dollars insurance because a month earlier he took out terrorist insurance on the buildings. Of course, the insurance company said, "Yeah, we'll insure them against terrorists because those are those are like solid 50 foot diameter steel telephone poles. No plane is going to even make a dent in one of those things." Okay, let's so, get to rebuttals. The, the last thing I, I would highly suggest. If you guys want to understand what's happening in America, cough up the $18 and get a book, uh, one of these things, Censored News. This is the yearly handbook that comes out once a year with the top 25 blacked out stories. And between 26, 2006 and 2011, Censored News was loaded with false flag articles explaining how the media sold us 9-11. And it culminated in the 2011 edition, which was on the New York Times was the number one bestseller for a week, okay. total media blackout. So let's uh, keep that in mind. Let's go to rebuttals. We're not going to have that many tonight, it looks like. We small. About four How minutes. people want to make a rebuttal? Okay, uh, over here, Gene is going to be Let's first. start him off. So we'll have, we'll have start with four minutes tonight for okay. everybody. And let's see if we can get out of here by near quarter to nine. All right. Thanks. You're up, Gene. You're up. I hate to be the first one. Uh, people that don't like me very well call me uh, Gulliver and Gulliver's Travels. But I will have to say that I just came from the peace group and they pretty much sound like what Ted just said. I will also have to say that I have almost no faith in the truth that our federal government tells us. 
Uh, and uh, so also when you look at the news, uh, once in a while I watch Channel 9, but it's all commercials. And I do watch Channel 11 and Channel 20. But to tell you the truth, I really doubt a lot of the stuff I see on Channel 11 wow. and Channel 20. It's full of commercials. I think it's a lot of it is not true. So also, I do want to mention that uh, Michael Moore. Michael Moore, uh, I think a lot of you know him, but uh, he was the only guy on the left that I know, other than Brad Little, who told, uh, suggested that some friends read Michael Moore, that predicted uh, our, about our, pre our president-elect mm -hmm. and that he would win. So what is the truth? I admit I am not true, sure, but I am very, very skeptical. And do I believe the President of the United States, this one, the last one, or the one that's coming, uh, do I believe they always tell the truth? No. Who's next for the rebuttals? Right. Who's next? Got an open mic up here. Okay, next. <coughs> Somebody, uh, no, nobody wants to give a rebuttal? Is it over tonight? I don't know, but I'll... How about you, Tim? You can get up and uh, blab for four minutes, right? <laughs> you, you know, I uh, find it somewhat difficult to believe the evidence. I can understand how well researched he is, and I can understand how well the amount of time you, you took into doing something. But, you know, I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I just have trouble believing that our government would systematically murder 3,000 people to pass a bill in Congress. I do know that, you know, we did go into Iraq for somewhat spurious reasons, and I still, to this day, can't figure out why Bush did it, except for the fact that, uh, you know, he wanted to get rid of a dictator and he was under the illusion of some conspiracy of the project for the new American century. Now, I've looked at a lot of this evidence myself, and what the administration had believed during that whole Iraq war was a pack of lies, but they honestly thought that through military intervention we could spread democracy through the Middle East and nation build. There was a guy by the name of Thomas P. M. Barnett who in the late and early 90s and later on advocated if we were going to do regime change that it be done quickly and that the United States had the capability of tearing down networks quickly. What Thomas P. M. Barnett also said was that the science of rebuilding the nation would take much, much longer to do. Now, he wrote, he wrote a book, and I, I've read it several times. It was called uh, The Pentagon's New Map, talking about the way war, wars were going to be fought in the next century or so and he said in a lot of cases there's not going to be a major power war because of the nuclear bomb equation what he said was they were going to be fighting groups individuals and terror groups out to get us and that's exactly what we've been seeing since 9 11 since the birth of isis and everything else after the Civil War, for example, there was a lot Thank of so people much. wanting to say, hey, we ought to just not surrender but go with guerrilla warfare and keep the country in a state of pandemonium for a while. But it was only thanks to Lee and his surrender at Appomattox and the general conditions of the North accepting that surrender that the Civil War actually ended without a catastrophic guerrilla warfare on the front. That, as a matter of fact, it took quite a while for that surrender to take place. 
you must remember that an insurgency and a terrorist group takes about 20 to 25 years to finally get rid of. And as a matter of fact, it took almost 50 years recently in Colombia to finally demobilize the FARC. Look at the other one that was there in, um, I think it was called the, uh, it was this country off India, and uh, it was, the name escapes me right now, but Sri they Lanka. too. What? Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, and they, uh, they, they, they just called themselves the Tigers. The, Ta Tamil Tigers. The Tamil Tigers. Yeah. It took them quite a few years to get rid of them, and it finally came through when their leader, the last of it, was captured or killed by the Sri Lankan government. Terrorist groups have been around us for many years, but like anything else, they go away, they're demobilized, peace is made. What has lasted is free trade, globalization, and generally the pattern of capitalist enterprise and democracy that's gone around the world for the last 200 years. And for me, I just cannot fathom that our own government would say and have a wholesale murder of, of things like this. I've heard of similar claims from other stuff in the Soviet Union and everything else, but I, I just, even with the presentation that Ted made tonight, which I thought was quite well done and quite well researched, I'm still having my doubts. Maybe I'm a little bit, uh, got my head in the clouds, maybe I'm just a little bit of a believer. You know, you all know my stance on nuclear power here and about thorium molten salt reactors and, and, and some of the views that are that are not shared by me, by Andy over here. We both look at the same evidence and we can draw immediate disparate conclusions on it. So I guess what I'm saying is that I look at the same standards, the same sets. I'm still having a little trouble swallowing this. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. And I'm trying to be honest with you, Andy, on this stuff. Well, yeah, the, the problem, I made up a couple of uh, couple of numbers you might want to try to memorize and use them in the future. Number one is this. Ten, can everybody see that? 10,000 to one, 10,000 over one. What that means is 10,000 times more light falls on the planet as energy every day than what the human race uses. Solar and wind power in the form of energy from the sun dwarf humanity's needs every day. It became obvious in 1998 that solar and wind power were going to be vastly cheaper than fossil fuel anywhere in the world. So the people that run our government uh, in the Bush Cheney combine, the oil companies, uh, what, uh, what Mr. Fuller called the grunch of giants. Grunch is gross universal cash heist what we call the seven sisters, the oil companies, the trillion, multi-trillion dollar octopus with its arms wrapped around the planet, the fossil fuel industry. They put their heads together and said, what can we do to keep America dependent on oil? What can we do to dominate and control the oil fields all over the world? Professor, well, it's easy to understand if you work with what Professor Ray, David Ray Griffin said. See this? 30% over seven. 30% over 7. He said, a professor friend of his said, David, you don't need an open mind to understand what happened on 9-11. You need a 30% open mind, a 7th grade education. That's how easy it is to understand the forensic evidence. You don't need an open mind in a college degree. Anybody that's played Little League Baseball understands uh, the idea of uh, gravity and uh, the way things fall through the atmosphere. If you hit something hard, will it turn to dust? No. The official story, what Ted, Ted didn't mention, he would have thought of it. 9-11 uh, is an example of what's called, there's a book on this, it's called a transparent conspiracy. You kill a whole bunch of people in broad daylight and you put out the official story immediately. And the official story is such a giant crock of mythological bullshit that as soon as you start to investigate any piece of it, you say, well, 
That's insane. Why would they be saying that? Well, they put out the official story as so implausible and impossible, it's a message to anybody that tries to investigate. We did this. We killed these people, and if you start looking into, try to prosecute or look for who did it, you can get killed, fired from your job, blackballed. That, that book I hold up. Uh, another thing, Project, this one. What, this, is, this is the best title, 9-11 Synthetic Terror. 9-11 was a synthetic event created by people within the United States. There was no Muslim attack on Americans. 9-11 was uh, created to keep the military-industrial complex going in the time of peace. There's no large groups of terrorists anywhere in the world looking to kill Americans. If there were, hundreds of Americans would be killed on American soil every day by terrorists. People could walk into a restaurant like this with a few things they could buy in a hardware store or Home Depot and kill 50 people. You don't need automatic weapons. That's a, a whole misnomer. Um, seven, you, to understand 9-11, you simply have to look at the evidence with an open, unbiased mind. Just look at the evidence. You start with one single fact. Seven buildings were demolished and there were only two plane crash events. A fifth grader can do the math on that one. If you want to look a little further, John Lear, the retired pilot, but I think it was uh, involved, I think it was his father was the inventor of the Lear jet. John Lear is a retired jet pilot, flown all kinds of aircraft, and he said, there were no planes hitting the towers on 9-11. What we were shown, as Ted was said, was a very crappy video, computer-generated images that were inserted into the news feed. <clears throat> it, was, it was, wasn't even professionally done. It, it, that, that's why I say it's a transparent conspiracy. If you get a Hollywood uh, expert uh, on film and stuff to look at that, say, oh yeah, that's a crappy video, that's not real. And a plane hitting a steel building like this, you would have had aluminum shrapnel and confetti flying everywhere. It would, uh, it would be like trying to throw an aluminum beer can through a cheese shredder and into a 30-foot diameter steel telephone pole. It would have no effect on the pole at all. Uh, but what we saw is clearly in all plane crashes with planes hitting mountain rock sides or going into the ground or whatever, you see aluminum shrapnel, tons of it flying everywhere. And that clearly wasn't in these videos because they were fake. So uh, those of you that uh, have internet access, the best news site I know of, the best of the best every day, except they don't talk about 9-11 because they've probably been threatened, 9-11 is the third rail. A lot of good news sites do not post anything on 9-11. And of course, they don't post anything either on uh, the end of the AIDS epidemic, even that's being talked about all over the world. You get outside the United States. But that's a, a topic for another night. It's commondreams.org, O-R-G, Common Dreams. That one is the top of the list. It's a news site that posts the best of the best news without Britney Spears and Lindsay Lohan and Kim Kardashian and all, all the others. So, and as I said, to answer his question back there and Charlie's too, when the evidence of a crime becomes overwhelming, you start to investigate and, and investigate and go after who had the means, motive, and opportunity. You don't wait years for the criminal to come in and say, I got tired of hiding out, so here I am, I did it, so let, let, why don't you prosecute me? That's not how the justice system works. We don't wait, we hunt criminals down like the Nazi hunters. They went after them after World War II. And incidentally, there's a West arrest warrants beginning to be sworn out for Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Rice in other countries as the war criminals they are for giving us 9-11 and giving us the results of 9-11. Incidentally, uh, the last thing I'll mention is a big cloud. Ask your friends, uh, what do you know about the cloud coming up out of Iraq? If they don't know, ask them again. What do you know about the cloud of depleted uranium dust drifting up out of Iraq and heading around the world? Iraq has been uninhabitable for humans <coughs> since 2005. Women can't have healthy babies over there anymore. They give birth to stillborn monstrosities that don't even look human because living in Iraq is like living downwind in the cloud of Chernobyl after it exploded. Big, big war crimes. So that's where we are. And there's all kinds of groups 
than like Ted is talking about, there's millions and millions of people involved in trying to take, to take back our country from the criminals that created these things. I'll, I'll probably do another presentation in a few months on this to answer these specific questions. Where, where are the groups, the names, dates, places where you can find all the information? Okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any more? Okay, go ahead. Why, why did why did the government produce 9/11? Why did they put bombs in the buildings? Because they wanted another war. And if you want to be against war, come to Logan Square every Saturday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. and you can hold a sign saying "End War." And and uh, protest, protest. protest. The protest every Saturday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. before the college. You get up, get in the fresh air, nice winter air to wake you up. And uh, you can go to uh, Neil, uh, Neil Steinberg, what's his name? Uh, Rosnick. Uh, Rosnick? I'm forgetting his last name. I now. forget. Anyways. Resnick. Resnick. Yeah. Resnick. Uh, Neil Resnikoff. Resnikoff. And, Resnikoff, uh, yes. And, our, and Betty. And, and Betty. Betty. And uh, this guy over here, he goes to <laughs> Lawrence and Kimball before the 2, two o'clock at noon. Early, noon to 1. Noon to 1 every Saturday. You can protest more, some more at war, and then you come to Logan Square from two to four, and then you come here and talk, talk about being against war. Thank you. What does that have to do with the topic? All right, all right. Okay, uh, a couple of thoughts on some of this. Uh, Ted, I thought your presentation was very, very good. Really good. Um, so, you know, one of the things has to do with beliefs. And, uh, you know, kind of thinking about this, I always bring up uh, the fact that when you're very young, uh, you get imprinted with all sorts of beliefs from your parents or the community. And once those beliefs are imprinted, it's very, very hard to let them go. And I, I'll give you an example. I, I saw a uh, a, present, a little presentation on the Real News Network by this uh, climate uh, scientist, maybe he's not a climate scientist, but it's his specialty, this guy, Guy McPherson, who, you know, basically says, uh, we're going to be extinct in a very brief period of time. And he also had a journalist with him, uh, somebody, I think maybe Dar Jamail, but they made an argument for that that uh, extinction was coming down the road, whether it was 20 years or whatever, very brief time. And I listened to it again, and I thought, you know what? Everything they're saying makes sense. It's logical. You know, they're, they're doing a very nice presentation of why that's so. But what I found was, even though I could take that in intellectually, found it of interest, I couldn't take it in emotionally because I had been programmed with a belief when I was very young that, I mean, I knew that I was going to die and all human beings are going to die. But I was, I had the belief, either it was put into me or I evolved it myself, that our, you know, human beings as a group, you know, species, whatever, however you want to term it, does not become extinct. And, uh, you know, it's just almost impossible for me to let that go. So I think when you're dealing with this kind of, uh, uh, these kind of issues, I was also taught when I was young that the United States government was very, very credible. Uh, you were supposed to respect them. You're supposed to be very patriotic. Uh, you know, and, and so that, that was put into me like it's put into most people. And it becomes very, very hard to let that go. And I think that in order for something, some of these beliefs to be pushed aside, 
uh, there has to be a lot of discussion and a lot of repetition. You know, it's very, very hard to maintain the counter evidence when you have beliefs that support something, you know, from long ago. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's thank Ted for a nice presentation and wonderful PowerPoint. I'll be eclectic as usual. We've been covering this topic for some time here at the college. I don't know where we're headed, but let me begin by this way. 35 years, I would get case files of alleged incidences, and they contain witness statements. And they also had our evidence files as well, the submissions, but primarily there were witness statements of what happened. Now 9-11 was a human activity. You said there was a bomb placed in the building. Who placed the bomb? What kind of bomb did they use? When did they do it? I have no witness statements whatsoever coming into this. Um, a lot of conjecture, but nothing in terms of an individual was willing to testify as to the sequence of events. Um, that's not a strong case. It's no case at all. You've got to have someone who, I read these cases, the people who participated say, yes, I, I'm guilty, I admit it, and I'll tell all of everything that went on and everyone who was involved. And, and they, they, they to get a reduced penalty or other, other sorts of arrangements. But you have no one here who is willing to do even this anywhere after, after years. So we don't know. We don't know if there was an explosive use, what kind of this, who did it. When they did it, and it's, it, it, it's expanded even that there was no explosive at all. It was some sort of external weapon, is the latest theory. Um, and then, you know, we're given some things. Well, these are not videos of a plane crashing into a building. They are cartoons. Well, who got the media to show cartoons? That's not a task that one does uni individually. Now, the other thing that surprised me, this is the first time I'm looking at photo photographs of wounds of a shooting. I've been involved in gun control issues, and there's 285, five or more person mass shootings in the United States. These don't, they don't photograph these wounds. Who's collecting these? Who did this for this incident? It's just no one photographs shooting incident wounds. And for what purpose? Um, there's another thing in this incident here, like when you're talking about there are 5,200 people who were shot or injured. I don't know the details. Uh, there seems to be any number of police who responded to this first responders and ambulances and these are all actors who are who have all remained to agree to this code and they all are on one story that's never happened that you could get I, I, I don't think you could get two three or four people let alone this would be hundreds to maintain such personal discipline it's just, uh, to me, unbelievable. Anyhow, we've been over this topic before. Um, <clears throat> I imagine we'll get uh, Bill Lee back here to <laughs> add some oh, more please, to, please, the, no. to yes, the yes, fire. Yes. But you guys, by the way, a Panzerfaust was a handheld weapon. You got into all this uh, tank warfare. Uh, it was used in the, in the final years of the Third Reich. Uh, they armed the civilians. They gave them these one weapons they could aim at a tank. And uh, it's not okay. that difficult. That's, that's all the munitions stuff I know about the Panzerfaust. Were the, the, the guys in tanks, one civilian 
they gave, they had old guy, uh, senior citizens, guys, and they gave them each one of these, and they could destroy a tank. They were very much, they're just soldiers, the U.S., particularly the Russians, were very much afraid of this. And it was the final act of desperation, but that's just military warfare. Anyhow, thanks a lot. We enjoyed it. Thank okay. you. Got the last round. Got the All right. Last word. Keep going, buddy. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> let me uh, start with that. <clears throat> Try to answer uh, a couple of Charlie's points. Uh, Charlie, we? Charlie, have you ever seen a movie? Any any movie? It's uh, especially a Hollywood movie. You have a cast of hundreds. You have producers. You have uh, uh, designers. Okay, this uh, these false flags, especially this one in Orlando, are pretty much movies. And you, so you have actors. You have a cast, and they're all on the same general script. Uh, one problem, though, was that they didn't stick to the, the exact script because they were, you know, making things up on the fly. So there were a lot of uh, very fundamental contradictions that proved that the whole thing was a hoax. But generally speaking, they were all on the same page. Excuse me, guys. Guys, generally speaking, they were on the same page because it was kind of like a movie or a play. Uh, secondly, um, you, when you talk about uh, uh, like a court situation where you bring in witnesses, you, you indict people, you, you uh, arrest people, that would require uh, an independent court, okay? Not a government court, because the government is the, is the, is the perpetrator. You're not, you can't, have, can't expect the government with its own courts to, to bring in its own uh, officials, okay? Uh, so if we, if we did have some kind of independent court, if we had a people's court, if we had a real democracy, uh, you could haul in a whole, all kinds of people, you arrest them and indict them and get them to testify. When, when what's his name, uh, Bush and Cheney, uh, quote unquote, uh, went to the uh, uh, commission, the 9-11 um, the, uh, commission to quote unquote testify, they didn't actually testify. They, there, was, there, was no, there were no sworn statements, there were no affidavits, it was done in private, etc. So you don't have, you actually literally don't have an independent court to do the proceedings that you're talking about, but if we did, we would be able to do it. Um, okay, um, there are a, a number of things that I didn't have time to go through, okay? Uh, for instance, the, the collapse, quote unquote, collapse of the building. It's physically impossible, and physicists have shown that it's very basic physics. You can't have a small piece of, of, of this larger structure coming down and destroying the rest of the structure as if, I mean, in free fall time, or roughly free fall time, as if uh, there was nothing be below it. That's very basic physics, high school physics, and it can be proven, okay? And I've seen that, uh, I have a video that it was proven that the time taken would have been more than the 10 or 11 seconds. So that's proof positive right there that uh, that was fake. Bill, um, did it with that cup. No, that was bullshit. Um, first, okay. He, what he, he took he took he took a, a five pound I think it was a five pound uh, um, uh, weight. Okay, he lifted it, uh, you know, way up several times above the height of the cup. Okay, and then he dropped it. Uh, and the disparity in the in the in the, in the mass between the uh, the weight and the cup was like I don't know three hundred to one. Okay. That is that there's no relationship whatsoever to what happened on 9/11. You didn't, you didn't see this tower, it's, you know, a hundred times more massive than the World Trade Center being lifted 10 miles up in the air and then dropped on the rest of the tower. Okay, so that was bullshit, and that's a good example of the kind of absolute bullshit. Yeah, I mean, what other word can I use? Okay, absolute nonsense peddled by Bill Lee, and it goes on and on. He, he, brought, in, he brought in a one millimeter steel plate and said, oh, hey, look, uh, you know, you can get, bullets can go through this, therefore uh, a plane can smash the World Trade Center tower. Where, where's the logic there? One millimeter steel plate. Why didn't he bring in a frigging tissue paper and say, well, I can poke this with my finger, therefore the uh, plane is going to knock down the World Trade Center. So that guy peddled so much crap that it's almost unbelievable. Okay, uh, let, let me, one piece of crap uh, that is it, it is just laughable. I don't know why anybody with two brain cells, okay, would take it seriously that a plane is going to come through, uh, uh, bury itself in the ground. The hard ground, where that you need, you need, you need backhoes, you need excavators, you need steel, you need uh, you, uh, a 150 foot plane cannot burrow into the ground and then and then nothing's found there. Okay, that is, and there are a lot of other aspects to that uh, Pennsylvania thing. 
that are absolute crap. You can't have cell phones uh, uh, in, uh, transmissions when it wasn't possible in 1991 from a plane. Okay, that's been proven. Um, and, and, then the, and then when you listen to the conversation that those people had, uh, the, Pen the, the Pennsylvania plane, it's right out of a very bad, uh, you know, uh, grade school uh, play. It's complete bullshit. Everything about 9-11, uh, and not, not to mention these other false flags, is just uh, such idiocy. You have to have, as, 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 Charlie, as Andy says, you have to have an open mind. You have to, first of all, you have to, first of all, Charlie, please, you have to, first of all, say, uh, you know, kind of like blank your mind and say, okay, let's look at the evidence objectively. You can't say, like Tim says, respectfully, Tim, you can't say, well, the government couldn't have done that, therefore I'm going to find some reason that, uh, you know, it doesn't add up. If the you, plane you didn't go into the hole, where happened to the passengers? There were no passengers, there was no plane, uh, uh, Charlie. Okay. So anyway, so you, you can't um, you can't you can't start with the premise that the government cannot kill a whole lot of people because right. then then you can't you, you start out with an impossibility. How are you going to prove something that's impossible? You already assume that it's impossible. Uh, so that premise is wrong. The U.S. government has killed millions of people for no good reason. In fact, for uh, as as uh, they were war crimes. The U.S. went into Iraq uh, on lies. Everybody knows this. Okay, this is not controversial. Right. And, and it was an international uh, uh, crime, and there was. No uh, justifiable reason to be doing this. They killed uh, a million, at least a million people in Iraq alone. Not to mention Vietnam. Not to mention Korea. Not to mention what the CIA did in in um, in, in, Iran. in in Guatemala, in, in Iran, in 1953. Uh, not to mention uh, 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 Operation Gladio in, in Europe, where they killed, slaughtered hundreds of people. Okay, and that came out. That actually, uh, speaking of your courts, uh, 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 Charlie, that came out. Yeah, because the Europeans are more open than us. That came out in the Euro in, in the, the European Union. Parliament uh, 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 investigated that openly and admitted, essentially admitted, that, um, that uh, Operation Gladio was a CIA operation killing uh, millions of people as false flags. Uh, not millions, hundreds of people as false flags. So, I, I, Tim is saying I got to wrap up, and, and that's a good thing because I could go on. Um, we have to start uh, with the premise, uh, not the premise, we have to clear our minds of, 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 of false premises that the U.S. government can't do this, and that um, this is all, you know, impossible. Um, there's a lot possible when you have evil people in high positions of extreme power with uh, resources of trillions of dollars, and they're imperialists. And this, they're, these are the modern-day conquistadors. Would anybody have thought that the conquistadors could go slaughter uh, countless people for fucking gold? Just this yellow metal? It doesn't make you know. You have to uh, you have to understand that people are capable of, of, of huge evil, especially when they when they have the power. And that's why we have to not have those kinds of people in power. We ordinary decent people, generally speaking, have to be in power. Thank you. All right. Close us out, Andy. Thank you. Okay, that, that will wrap up another evening at the College of Complexes. Uh, I invite all of you to start logging on to Common Dreams and start looking at mainstream news. Uh, Common Dreams and Patriots, question 9-11. You want to know how many thousands of Patriots are in different groups? Retired military people, all of that. There's a huge wealth of documented evidence. So thank you all for coming, and we will hopefully see you next week. Thank you.